discussion on the way back today, and you brought something up I think that the public should know. Uh, we spoke about Malachi Martin. <coughs> he was a friend of mine. Yes, and I certainly work with him also. Um, we were going to do a video uh, because he felt that the the real terms of La Salette were never given. True. And you indicated something to me. Can we expound that just a little bit? I know one line, not more than that. I know there's one line in the message of La Salette, and uh, I have uh, the com confirmation about that via telephone. It might have been Malachi Martin, you see, who told me that, because we actually had several talks on the telephone. And uh, there is one line, one line that I know of, in the message of La Salette that has been censored universally. I cannot, in good conscience, say who was the one who censored it. I cannot say it was the Pope or the Cardinals. I believe it, it, it was uh, uh, a Pope. And, and again, I uh, do not know which one. So let's leave that question. The line that was censored was that uh, Our Lady said that in the, in the, the, the coming century or the 20th century, that I don't remember, I remember literally the quotation, there will be deux papes vermoulus, en français, two worm-ridden popes. Deux papes vermoulus. You speak French? Ah, bien. Deux papes vermoulus. Two worm-ridden popes. Uh, your next question should be, who were those two worm-ridden popes? <laughs> we have such a great choice. <laughs> um, I, I positively, positively, in all justice, I positively exclude John Paul I. Positively. One of my best friends in all the 15 years that I spent in Rome was Cardinal Pericle Felici who was one of the closest friends that Albino Luciani, John Paul I, ever had. John Paul I was uh, certainly not an Orthodox Catholic. No way. Uh, John Paul I uh, made quite a few statements, uh, including a very interesting uh, fictional correspondence with a Satanist author of the 19th century, which uh, is quite a puzzlement to those who know that man. Uh, I'm talking about Bossuet. Um, but uh, John Paul II is certainly not what you would call uh, a pape vermoulu, a worm-ridden pope. Because when you study the, 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 the history of the church, and I'm not talking again about that poor, poor, poor pope Liberius who is always used as the, the scapegoat for all uh, accusations against the church. I'm talking about people like uh, the above-mentioned Paul IV, who was a paranoid maniac. When you go into the, the close history of Pope Paul IV, the way he treated cardinals, like he had them arrested without explaining to them why they were arrested. He would call uh, an English cardinal, this is a fact, he would call an English cardinal into uh, his audience. It means that English cardinal was expecting to face the Pope and say, hi, your, sanct your holiness. And instead, uh, two doors were opened, he was led into a huge hall. There the English cardinal stood and didn't know what to do. Bang! The doors shut behind him. Another two doors opened. Two Swiss guards arrived and arrested him. He asked, what's the matter? What's happening to me? Oh, we don't know. We've just been ordered to arrest you. The guy was in prison until Paul IV... The guy, the cardinal. The cardinal was in prison until Paul IV died. So we've had quite a few interesting specimens of the human race... Uh, on the papal throne. And we have had Alexander VI. Alexander VI not only, which is something understandable to every man in the world, not only had children, but Alexander VI had children while he was Pope. Worse than that, he abused his papal authority to legitimize his daughter Lucretia. This is, I think, the, the far by far the worst. Hilaire Belloc says that the very moment that Alexander VI legitimized his physical daughter, he was uh, uh, ridiculing the priesthood. 
celibacy is not of the essence of priesthood, but it's intimately connected with priesthood. And he ridiculed this by legitimizing his own daughter. So we have had quite a few interesting characters in the papacy. And I don't see a reason why Our Lady would bother to call somebody like uh, Luciani, Albino Luciani, John Paul I, a Pap Vermoulu. Now, if we go into the Sedevacantis theory, which is, again, I say a very daring theory, because we are the ones who have the proof, who have to have the proof for it, and not the Pope. See, in the Church, you're not allowed to, uh, to utter a suspicion unless you have at least some... Uh, high probability or proof and uh, yet there is hundreds of people running around especially in this country who say that we haven't had a pope and then they can't even decide since when we have another I've ha I've, I, I received a letter uh, a couple of years ago that told me that Pius X was not a pope he was the anti-pope because he reformed the breviary so well Probably the next time I'm going to hear that Pope Linus was not a pope and Peter was the first and last pope. Uh, see, these are, it's all absurd because you have to have definite proof. Did Hillary Clinton uh, cease to be president when she betrayed the Constitution? No. So, uh, the same thing is true here. Let's, but, but for argument's sake, let's say we have not had a pope since 1958. Who were the Pope Vermoulu? Pius XI, with his terrible mistake of instituting the Catholic action, and Pius XII with changing Holy Week? Hey, see, there you are. That's one of the things that the Society of St. Pius X absolutely hates about Father Hess, that I dare to even utter the most remote criticism about Pope Pius XII. Uh, well, uh, as if he was untouchable. Uh, he's not. <laughs> Alexander VI was as much Pope as Pius XII, and he was not untouchable. Uh, these, uh, you, you, you shouldn't confuse dogma with judgment. And uh, so who are the, the Pape Vermoulu? Is it true what they say that in 1986 with Assisi, uh, John Paul II ceased to be Pope, so the, the De Pape Vermoulu would either be John Paul II and Paul VI, or Paul VI and John XXIII, or John XXIII and Pius XII, or Pius XII and Pius XI. Hey, wait a second. Our Lady said there's going to be De Pape Vermoulu, two worm-ridden popes. My personal guess, don't say Father Hess dogmatically pronounces that this is such. My personal educated guess, educated, but guess, is that the De Pape Vermoulu where Paul VI and John Paul II, but let's wait for the next one. <laughs> I think we're in for a treat.
Is the Catholic Church the one true church that God created? Yes. Can you prove that? Yes and no. Give me the no. I will give you the yes and I will give you the no. If I can prove to you that a priest can turn this glass of wine within the context of Mass, of course, into the blood of our Lord, then I've given you proof. If I cannot prove that to you, then I will have to uh, admit to have, having failed. What is proof? Circumstantial evidence? Factual evidence? The only solution left according to probability? What is proof? Max Planck, without whom there would have been no Albert Einstein. Max Planck said in one of his greatest uh, little papers of 1941, Sinn und Grenzen, 1949, excuse me, Sinn und Grenzen der exakten Wissenschaft, sense and limits of the exact sciences, or not as a literal but a real translation, purpose and limits of the exact sciences. He said, even within the modern Western concept of scientific proof, no scientist can escape in publishing the results of his research without letting his Weltanschauung interfere. Weltanschauung, a term known to those who have studied philosophy in the United States as being your view of the world. All the atheism going on today, of course, the word God has been substituted with the word evolution, whatever that means. Darwin didn't know, and we don't. And uh, some others substitute the word of God with nature. Some others say Mother Nature or Earth, whatever they call it. They might hate it, but many of them are talking about God without knowing God, without knowing what God is, who he is, and so on. They cannot help it but let their own Weltanschauung interfere with their scientific results. So what is proof? However, let's take uh, one of the most exacting understandings of the word proof to be found in what is called the exactent Wissenschaft, the exact sciences, in the Western concept of exact science. A supposedly a concept without mythology, supposedly a concept without superstition. I can easily show to you that modern physics, less chemistry, but modern physics, even uh, things like astronomy, are jam-packed with superstition, guesswork, and of course errors. But they all will look like science. Is there a mathematical proof for the Catholic Church being the only true church? No, that's impossible. God allowed us to discover mathematics, but mathematics cannot prove anything. On the contrary, what do mathematics prove outside numerical concepts? Can mathematics prove that you exist? Can mathematics prove that we are sitting here talking? No. Mathematics can prove that 4 and 4 is always 8. And if you call 4 and 4 9, then you just substituted the word 8 with the, with the word 9. Mathematics are something that doesn't even exist on its own. Mathematics is always in something else. It's in our mind, basically which is the only reason why God cannot break mathematics. 
if he works a miracle, he turns uh, five bread into 3,000 and something, and he just did five plus five plus five plus five, and you name it. You formulate it the way you want it. God cannot turn four apples plus four apples into nine apples. It would just simply be four plus four plus one. And the one is the miracle. Because God is not absurd, not illogical. However, that doesn't prove that he exists or that the church would be true or in existence. I just wanted to show you that with mathematics you can only prove very few things. Very few. Are we then to apply a chemical proof to the existence of God and the true church? What does chemistry prove? 35 years ago, most biochemists in this country agreed with the Federal Drug Administration on carbohydrates being the necessary basis of your life. Now, biochemists will tell you, no, that's not true. You better watch your carbohydrates. Uh, you better concentrate on uh, uh, vegetables and fruit. I happen to believe that. However, I wouldn't be surprised if in 10 years from now they tell you fish alone is your salvation. Biochemistry is a science that I believe to be among the most serious, the most uh, honest, and the most reliable. Unlike astronomy, where they always try to find life on some unknown planets, unlike astronomy, where they always try to tell you that uh, there is a hundred thousand planets with a civilized life going on, uh, where they still look for life on Mars. Uh, Unlike astronomy, that will always try to tell you that uh, the universe has never started and will never end, uh, which is something we attribute only to God. Uh, unlike astronomy, biochemistry usually tries to stay within its own uh, scientific borders. And this is a science that I very much uh, appreciate and study. However, biochemistry is absolutely incapable of telling you what wine is. Oh yes, biochemistry can write three big, big books on wine. The biochemists are divided over the issue on how many substances are to be found in wine. They don't even know how many, let alone what. Some biochemists will swear an oath to you that there's only 200 things in this uh, wine. Some others will swear an oath to you all, oh, it's got to be at least 600 because we have already separated, as you say in chemistry, we have already separated a 180 or something, or maybe now it's 220 already. But I guess because you find this and that and that in wine, there must be such and such and such. Biochemistry cannot even explain wine to you. And you know what? Biochemistry cannot even explain water to you. In some electrochemical processes, we find a type of water. Oh, yes, it's H2O. And it's not heavy water, and it's not ultra-heavy water. It's just a hydrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen. That water, however, freezes one centigrade, or half a centigrade, lower than regular water. It won't give you those opaque type of uh, ice crystals. It will give you crystal clear, almost bluish crystals. It's H2O. But you only find it, well, not only, but you usually find it in uh, some determined electrochemical processes. Biochemistry, biochemist, biochemical proof for God? Yes, and yet there is one. We'll talk about that later. Then how about a, a historical proof of God? Jokingly, I could give you one that the church must be a, a, a divine institution. The church has survived for 2,000 years such a bunch of bad priests and bad popes, it must be divine. Proof? No. Then what proof? Theological proof? No. Theology, by definition, is based on revelation. What if there was never a revelation? 
What if some intelligent people wrote up the gospel? Some intelligent people wrote up the Old Testament. They were intelligent enough to make you believe it's a divine inspiration. No, no proof. And how about philosophy? What philosophy? Greek. Philo, Sophia. Sophia, wisdom. Philo, I like it. Somebody is a Francophile, that means he likes the, fro the, the French, the French. If somebody is, uh, likes this and this and this, you always add the Greek syllable, phil. So, philosophia means philosophy, the love for wisdom. In ancient Greece, wisdom was not necessarily distinguished from the word knowledge. A philosopher meaning is a man who uses, who applies his reason to find out the truth. Let's see if we, if we can prove the church being the only true church or God existing with the only and mere application of our reason. Well, I look at myself and I say, here I am. I exist. term exist because the term exist implies you're coming from somewhere else because there is the ex sister I'm here and I'm ex somewhere from somewhere I came to be I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about it why do I sit here the very fact that I think about it shows that uh, I'm actually here the famous French philosopher Descartes in Latin called Cartes Cartesius Cartesius he would say, said cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. The man, therefore, attributed his existence to the very fact that he was thinking. How could he think before he existed? Goes to show you how wrong a philosopher can be. Well, obviously, I think because I am here. So, uh, sum ergo cogito, I am, therefore I'm here. Therefore I think. Where did I come from? Thank you, my parents, I know. Where did my parents come from? Their parents. Who made their parents? Theirs and theirs. Let's go back all generations. We pretend there is no revelation, so I don't know anything about Adam and Eve. Was there ever a first human being? Yes. There is mathematical proof that it is absurd to state that there was never a first human being. That would be in mathematics, that would be the famous n plus 1. n plus 1. n, the unknown number, plus 1. Is it possible that there were n plus 1 human beings? If you expand your mind, it would be ignoring revelation or any uh, religious binding, conceivable that there was an infinite amount of men. Yet, yet, n plus 1 is again a number. A number is finite. If there was an infinite an, uh, number of human beings, an infinite number of men, who made the still first one? Is it conceivable? Would you call a human being rational who would tell you there has been an infinite amount of human beings, there never was a first human being? Yes, you could. I can also prove to you that everybody is uh, is uh, persecuting me. And you would perhaps suggest that I suffer of paranoia. And then you would perhaps suggest to me uh, that I should rather go into the matter and check if really everybody is after me. Really everybody is out to destroy me. The whole world is after me and the whole world wants to destroy me. And I would listen to your reason say yes John you got a point that makes a great deal of sense to me you would say huh yeah 
And after about three weeks of your constantly explaining to me in the most precise and concise logics why it is that it is not the whole world that's after me and that's not every single human being that's after me. Like you, for example, you just spent three weeks of your precious time to explain to me that I shouldn't have sleepless nights over the whole world being after me. I would say, yes, John, but I think you are the very first who's after me. Why else would you go through three weeks to prove to me that you're not my enemy? Good trick, John, but I'm not going to fall for it. Medicine calls it paranoia. Gilbert Keith Chesterton calls it the maniac. A maniac is a man whose logics start from what he says, that rubber cell of one idea. Philosophy has something to do with wisdom. You don't call a paranoid, a paranoid person somebody who has really wisdom. You call him a sick man. We won't condemn him. On the contrary, he's sick. He's maybe uh, quite innocent in his, of his state, but uh, you can't say that somebody who will tell you that every single human being is out to kill him is a normal human being. So, it seems that if we want not to be normal in the sense of following majorities, God forbid, but uh, in the sense of applying our reason the way we have it i'm not saying it was created we're not at that point yet I'm saying i sit here i think about something and i hopefully don't do it the way a maniac does in that single-minded single cell rubber cell idea that it is determined that is determining and uh, oppressing every other thought and I would have to say, okay, there was a first human being. So let's see in the way a proof, like in court, circumstantial evidence, probability, inescapability in your thinking. We have to arrive at the conclusion there was a first human being. Let's for the moment, for, this, for, the, for the sake of argument, agree with... Uh, those people who naively think that the first human being uh, came out of the sea, uh, got somehow four legs, and then went up a tree and became man. Who created that first cell that started life? Where did that cell come from? Where did that planet come from in which that cell was formed? Where did that sun come from whose light, which is something measurable, created that first spark of life? Where did the matter come from out of which that sun started to work the way it works? Where did that space and time come from in which the sun became what we know the sun? A medium-sized star. What was in the beginning? Let's say it was 15 billion years ago. I have absolutely no problem with that. Let's say 15 billion years ago, something started, a big bang. Who ignited that big bang? Who lit the fuse for the big bang? Big bang of what? Where did whatever did the big bang come from? What came from where and went into that so-called Big Bang? How? Was there something before the Big Bang? Or maybe, possible, yes. But where did that come from? Let's say, like some suggest, this Big Bang is already the uh, nth time of a Big Bang. Then we are back to the question, uh, who was the first human being? So... What was the first Big Bang? Or, okay, you don't agree with the theory of the Big Bang. Fine with me. What was the first universe? What was the first spark? Where did that come from? We have to arrive 
very necessarily unless we want to join with the paranoids in that crowd. We have to arrive very necessarily at the point where we say something was first. Something was first. Was it something? Everything that's moved, everything that moves is moved by somebody else. I move this glass. If I drop it right now, what makes it fall in my lap and spill the wine? Modern science will tell you it's gravity. In metric system 9.81 meters per second square, gravity. Supposedly a certain Newton discovered it. Or maybe some people will say he invented it. Inevitably, gravity is very much of influence in our life. Uh, those who get older know what I'm talking about. Those who have already broken their legs because of a fall, those who have jumped the bridge and survived will tell you that gravity is of quite important, quite some importance to us. What moves gravity is a matter, concentrated matter, mass moves gravity. Where did the mass come from? We'll always end up with the same question. What was first? What was the first thing? Who was the first mover? And now we already, in our common sense language, we didn't say what was the first mover. We already, in common sense, you would say who was the first one to move anything. Now, aha, aha. Inevitably, almost, I know I'm manipulating you, but inevitably, we came to, to use the word who. Can we prove that we ought to use the word who? I guess so. What have all fingerprints, you can check in the FBI files, what have all fingerprints of all men in common? A pattern. Like a, something like a curve around the thumb here. There is no such thing as a fingerprint that looks like a chessboard. All fingerprints of all people all over the earth, if it's now 5 billion something or 6 billion something, and if it was 40 billion, there would be 40 billion fingerprints, all 40 billion fingerprints having more or less the same type of pattern. Sure, it's called a species. Must have something in common. There's a pattern, yes. Uh, in that thing that uh, the most illuminated scientists of our days call evolution, there is quite such a thing as a fingerprint, a pattern. A pattern is one of the most distinct characteristics of personality. If we talk common sense, otherwise it's a waste of time to continue talking. If we talk common sense. Pattern means something that is common to several things. Behind a pattern, there is always that what we call a mind. A mind creates a pattern. Like, uh, you don't have to know whose painting it is. If you have studied art history, you'll find out. You don't have to read the signature. If you have studied art history or the history of music, you will be able to assign a certain piece of music that you've never heard before to a certain composer. Not infallibly so, but you will be able to do so. Pattern is the word. There is a pattern in that what illuminated scientists today call evolution. There's a pattern. I don't even go into the, uh, in, into the fact that evolution cannot be proven because the missing link is still missing, and everywhere it's missing, and anywhere it's missing. We never dug up the missing link. We didn't, dug up, uh, we didn't dig up the first uh, thing between a chicken and a rat, or a chicken and a bird, and a chicken and uh, a nightingale. We never did. However, uh, let's say we still haven't dug it up. Tough luck for us. It's still a pattern. Into that whole thing, some oh-so-illuminated people call evolution, there's still a very distinct and clear pattern. Show me one galaxy where a certain amount of matter under certain 
more and more determined conditions to, to today didn't turn out to be a sun, didn't evolve into a rotating sun. Just take the fact of rotation. The entire universe is based on rotation. There's always the mass gravity center and some other things flying around it. St. Thomas say, said the angels are holding up those planets. To, today's science believes that mathematics alone can do it, or physics. We'll find out if St. Thomas was right. I believe he was, but <laughs> we can't prove it. And of course, St. Thomas would have been wrong if he said that was the only reason. Today's science knows a lot more and says the only reason why a planet is rotating around Earth is because of gravity and speed. Who gave that planet the speed? What gave that planet the speed? Why are, even though every single celestial body has very little in common with any other one, just look at the difference between the, the four giant planets. You know what I mean. However, the pattern is the same. There is the sun, and there is, uh, is it 9, or is it 10, or is it 11, maybe it's even 12 planets rotating around that sun. That sun is rotating around the center of gravity of our Milky Way, which most probably is a black hole. Then we look at the Andromeda fog, 2, billion, 2 million light years away, and uh, we'll see again the same thing. There's a center of gravity. See, I'm talking about the Andromeda uh, fog, the galaxy, and the light goes out. Just to show you, there's a pattern. The light will go out when I'm sitting here. It will not go out when we don't need it. There is a pattern, again, there's a pattern wherever you go. Some people call it Murphy's Law. And we look at that galaxy, the Andromeda, same thing. Center of gravity, everything is rotating around it. That's not a pattern. See, our galaxy is a fingerprint. Andromeda is a fingerprint. NC 532G, uh, whatever the galaxy is called, the stellar system, fingerprint. There's a pattern. Behind the pattern, there is a mind. We rightly say, who was the first mover? So now, miraculously, the light has gone on again, and Murphy's Law has been beaten again. Um, we have come to the point of substituting the word what with the word who. Who made the first move? Who put the first thing, whatever it was? It is not an intelligent, and it's not an unintelligent idea to say that, physically speaking, the universe was created by the creation of time and space. That's something that has been plausibly defended in a doctoral dissertation. Even if that dissertation is fully true, it will still not suffice to say something started it. You will need in common sense, in applying common sense, which is the way towards wisdom, you will have to admit who did it because of the pattern. The pattern, a pattern is also the visible or noticeable expression of a mind. Who has a mind? What has a mind? In order to create a pattern, be it a pattern in music, art, or the fingerprint, or the universe, needs a mind. The very concept of mind presumes personality. Otherwise, we have to go on and change the dictionary and put in different terms for mind, personality, pattern, whatever. If we want to stay with common sense, we will use uh, the English language, not necessarily in, in the exclusive context of today's notions, but we will use it in a common heritage of usage. Like when you 
one of my uh, favorite dictionaries, the American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language. Uh, the very name American Heritage Dictionary refers to what I uh, mean. It's a heritage. Uh, a pattern is a word that has many other ways of being written down in other languages, but it will always mean the same. So it is with the word personality. At least there is some common denominator to the word person or personality and to the word mind. Who made the first move? Who put, who put whatever or who made whatever was needed to get this whole thing, the universe and whatever it is going? Who? We will see something else. Whoever that was, and we don't know who it was, supposedly, who ever made the first move is obviously someone before whom nobody was and nothing was. Otherwise, we'd be back to the original question, who was the first human being, what was the first uh, planet, what was the first sun, uh, where did the Big Bang come from, what was the first Big Bang? When was the first Big Bang? Who made it? Who started? The one who started is really the one who started. Otherwise, we're talking nonsense here. Total and utter nonsense. The very one who started the whole thing must be, logically, not just greater than what he started. If he's just simply bigger, larger, or greater, or older, or more powerful than what the whole thing is, the universe, the whole creation, what well, we call it creation, let's not call it creation, everything that we know, everything that we know must be infinitely, I say infinitely, not eternally, infinitely smaller than whatever or whoever, we have come to agree on the point whoever, whoever made this thing. Why must it be infinitely smaller? But whatever, whoever made everything that we know, obviously not only configured this whole universe, everything that we know, according to a certain pattern, but very obviously he is. He was. The modern physical science will prove to you that time and space are nothing but dimensions. If time is a dimension and space is a time is a dimension, then whoever made this whole thing has no time and no dimension. No space, no time. Space and time, that's why I said what I said before. Space and time are his creations too. They're limited. They're countable. They're measurable. Whoever started this whole thing is therefore absolutely and totally outside of time and space. A part of what we have cannot create everything we have. That is obvious nonsense. A cake cannot be a smaller than all of its pieces. And the traditional way of putting it is the pieces of the, uh, the slices of a cake cannot be larger than the whole. Uh, okay. Whoever made this is outside time and space. Outside time and space me means we have come to the point to understand there is a person. That person never started and ne will never stop. If it starts, we apply the concept of time. If it ever stops or ceases to exist, then we apply the concept of time. There was a yesterday, therefore, and there will be a tomorrow then. So whoever started this whole thing has no extension and no duration. He never started. He will never cease. He has no size and no limit. That's what we call perfect. Why do we call it perfect? Per facere in Latin means to do something thoroughly through. To 
to make it perfect, I mean, to, to apply everything that's needed to fulfill the whole thing. Nothing is needed anymore, nothing is lacking. Is it possible that whoever made this whole universe was lacking in this universe, so he made it? If he was lacking the universe, then how could he make it? If he made it, he is bigger, larger, and greater than what he made. If he's bigger, larger, and greater than what he made, then he doesn't need it. Does he need anything? If he needed something, he would need something else. Where does that something else come from? If he needs something, if he's lacking something, the word lack implies that there is something that you lack. There's something you miss out on. It is impossible to say that that very first being, the very first mind that created the whole thing, lacked something. The definition of lack is not a definition as such. It is the declaration of something missing. I cannot say something is amiss if I do not know what is amiss. If I know what is amiss, then I know something that is larger or bigger or greater or more complex or more simple than what is here. I cannot say, look, this table is missing a fourth leg. If I do not know that a table uh, with four legs exists. Maybe this table isn't even lacking uh, a fourth leg because it was conceived as a three-leg table. The word missing is a negative. A negative presumes a positive. First I have to determine something positively in order to be able to say later on, okay, but it misses and lacks such and such. Whatever is the very first has no space, no time, but a mind cannot lack anything. It's impossible. A lack can only be there if it was more before. Can that one mind that has created this universe lose something? If it lost something, then it could still be greater, bigger, or larger than the universe he, that mind, created. However, if he lost something, then there was something in a way of dimension or moral dimension missing. Again, we apply the impossible concept of missing. Missing means you have some definition prior to that. As I said before, first I have to determine what is a table. If I determine there is no such thing as a table without four, with, uh, with less than four legs, then I have to uh, find a new term for this thing here that has three. For those who can't see, there is a table with three legs that's quite charming. Uh, the very word of negative, the very, very concept of the negative, the very concept of something lacking, needs a prior concept that will determine what might be lacking. But that very first mind that is prior to everything that we know or do not yet know, that very first universe, if you want, that very first Big Bang, if you want, that very thing that is first of all other things, that very mind that has imprinted its pattern on everything that we know, on everything that we call creation and beyond and more, that very first thing cannot lack anything by definition. It also must be absolutely, totally and perfectly, perfectly simple. There's no way around it. It must be absolutely simple. Why? Complicated means it's composed. Who composed it? Who? 
compose, compose in, in the English language. Uh, that's a wonderful thing. We have so many Latin terms. Componere, to put together. This is a composition. There is a glass with wine in it. Without the wine in it, this thing doesn't make sense. With the wine in it, holding the wine, now it's a composition that makes sense. It's complicated, it's complex, it's composed. Not just the glass, but what I hold in my hand is composed. There's the glass, there's the wine in it. The purpose is another thing. The purpose. Well, I'll come back to that later. Next week, maybe. Composition. Impossible. It can't be the first. The first cannot be composed. The first must be infinitely simple. Summing up what we said so far, at the origin of everything, there is a mind, therefore a person. There is a mind that's infinitely simple and perfect. Can, what if that mind changes its mind? change into what? If it could change, it would be perfect. If it could change, change. Yes. What, mean, what does change mean? Change means it becomes different. Difference. Difference means it's not what it was. If it is not what it was, then it wasn't perfect in the first place. Or what if it just loses the perfection? Then it must be composed, because infinite simplicity cannot lose anything. Infinite simplicity cannot fall apart. That's impossible. So it cannot lose anything. Can it gain? No, no. If it gains, it's not infinitely simple anymore. The moment it gains, it's complex. It gained what? It, infinite simplicity cannot gain infinite simplicity. What, how would you go about in saying, uh, what would that mind that has created everything, and that is perfect, infinitely simple, what would that mind say about itself? Can it speak? Well, if you can create a universe, it can also speak. Can it speak? Maybe in a way we don't understand. Let's say we presume we understand it. That mind would have to say, I, of course it's a mind, and it's infinitely simple. If it's infinitely simple, then it is. It's not complex, it's perfect, but basically it is. So I is, is bad language, so you say I am. We're at the point that we know, realize in our applying our common sense, long before everything else, everything, long before everything else. Somebody was able to say, I am. You want to call that God? Why would you call it God? The, the Latin word for God is Deus. Deus is the genitive of the nominative of Zeus. Zeus. You want to call it God? Well, sometimes we human beings have uh, to rely on compromises. Therefore, there is somebody who can say about himself, I am, and cannot really add anything else. Anything he adds might be interesting, but will not be uh, a perfect self-description. Self that very first mind that uh, made all these uh, fingerprints and to make something out of nothing is the perfect definition of creation, by the way, if you want to check in the dictionary. Uh, to turn something into something else already is called creation, but that infinitely simple being that can only say I am 
uh, obviously must have created out of nothing. Otherwise, there was again something before and then something before that. And we are back to the number first, uh, number one question. So there's somebody who can only say about himself, I am. You want to call it God? I don't care if you call it God, if you call it evolution or whatever you call it. I've just proven to you that God exists. Now that I have proven to you that God exists, only now I will add that, by the way, Vatican I pronounced it a dogma that the human being, applying only his reason, can discover God. This I am is perfect, infinite, eternal, absolutely simple, and therefore it must be absolutely, totally good. Unless you want to change every single language existing on earth, which is again a maniac's task. Every single language in the whole world, whether it applies it right or wrong, understands the word good as something not lacking, the word bad as something lacking. God, I am, lacks nothing. If he lacks nothing, then he's perfectly good. So, there is one God, he never started, he never stops, that's what you call eternal. There can nothing be added, nothing being taken away, that's what you call infinitely simple or absolutely simple. He has a person, and therefore the best way for him to describe himself would be to say, I am. Still playing the skeptic. There's a funny book in which you find that term. Some people call that book the Old Testament. Some people call it the Bible. That's the only book I know in which you find several times that somebody contradicting all rules of grammar, contradicting all rules of reason, says about himself, I am. I don't know if that book is true, however, there is a point in that book where some bearded old man goes up to a mountain, finds a thorn bush that's glowing, pretty incredible story, tall story, and out of that bush comes a voice and talks to him. Of course, he scratches his head and says, uh, yeah, sounds good to me, but whom am I talking to? And the answer is, I am who I am. Doesn't make sense, unless we have discussed what we discussed. That burning thorn bush obviously was claiming to be God. Then on another occasion, another bearded fellow walks around. He's known as a carpenter or carpenter's son who learned the business too. And some learned men, wise priests, challenge him on his talking about Moses, centuries before that. And they say, you're not yet 40 years of age, and you talk as if you knew Moses. And he says before, hey, Abraham, I'm sorry, not Moses, Abraham. Well, who cares what the name is? He says, before Abraham was, I am. Another guy who claims to be God, the pious people around him, very logically, very uh, consequently, grab stones because in those days it was under capital punishment to pronounce that word because these people believe that whoever says I am makes himself God. On another occasion, they finally arrest that man. And in order to be able to arrest him, he turns around and says, he's looking at some people coming up, obviously challenging him, challenging him and says, who do you look? Who are you looking for? Oh, we're looking. Uh, we're looking for somebody who's called. Uh, wait a second. Let me see. Uh, it's called Jesus of Nazareth. And he turns around. And the interesting thing is, he doesn't say. According to that book, he doesn't say you found him. Congratulations. He says 
I am. <gasps> These people are terrified. Step back, fall on to earth. They're all terrified. And again, because contrary to most translators of that book, even uh, where uh, you would suspect uh, anything but lousy translations, say, oh, I'm, I'm the one. But in the original text of the book, as far as we can determine in the history of literature, in the original text, he doesn't say that. He says, I am. It's that chapter that's called The Passion of St. John in that book. He says, I am. He doesn't say, I'm the one you're looking for, or you found him, congrats. Or he doesn't say, uh, I'm here, or I'm the one. He says, I am. They're shocked. Again, they're faced with a man who calls himself what they believe was the name of God. I've just proved to you that it is the name of God. The only book where that name appears in that context is the Bible. Is that proof that the Catholic Church is the only true church? No, not at all. It's a hint. Very strong hint. It's what you call in court admissible proof. It's not just a hint. It is at least a less than probable coincidence that there is only one book where what we have established must be the name of who created everything is claimed by two people. One who doesn't appear because there's only a burning bush and another one who says it more than twice. Now, we have said, we have concluded everything that can be absolutely proven by reasoning alone. And I can tell you, here we stop. There is that I am. What else can we say about him? Here is the I am. What else? Where is he? Who is he? We cannot escape the conclusion that he is infinitely good. Very relative term, especially nowadays, what is good. If he is infinitely good, according to common understanding worldwide, and if he made us, then he must be somehow interested in our welfare. That doesn't sound plausible at all. When you look at everything that's going on in this world, just think of what happened recently. It doesn't sound like somebody who cares very much about us. But then we know, on the other hand, and that is conclusive proof, we know that this I am who created us is not only infinitely good, but he's also eternal. We also know, conclusive proof, that he has equipped at least uh, a few of us with uh, such a thing called mind. We won't go into the discussion of, about how many of those people that we call people are mindless people, but anyway, uh, I guess you got one and I got one mind. If he created us, giving us a mind, then he must have given us that goes a little bit beyond what we can touch. The very fact that we can, that we can talk about uh, God, the I am, who cannot be touched, who cannot be seen, who cannot be felt, who cannot be but be, means that we can grasp something that's infinitely greater than you and me together. And we are great. I hope. Um, we can grasp something that's infinitely greater than the entire universe. Therefore, we must have in us something that's infinitely greater than the universe. That can't be matter. You want to call it spirit? Call it spirit. You want to call it the un ungrabbable, the untouchable? Call it whatever you want. In Papua, they call it taboo, the taboo, that which you can't touch. Call it what you want. The usage of the English language will call it soul. That what can't be touched in a human being, the soul of a human being, that which is superior to the body of a human being. Let's stay conventional and call it soul. If he has given us a soul, 
and he has given us that something uh, greater than uh, matter. Will it be something that will disappear with us? Possible. No conclusive proof that it won't. However, the probability is entirely in favor of that soul surviving. Why did he bother to give us a body if afterwards only the soul is left? I don't know. I can't prove it to you. I don't know. Probability will say, obviously, because that body will somehow still be there. Spiritual body, apparition, I don't know. We can't go into that. But we can definitely say that the soul in a human being is not an invention of some fabulists. It is a logical conclusion. It's the only thing that has probability going for it. Conclusive proof, like we did in finding the I am, impossible. Pro proof by probability. Proof not only by probability 60 versus 40, but proof by the only probable answer. The only answer that has plausibility. The only answer that has sense that has a ring of sense to it a ring of reason to it if we have that soul and if uh, the one who created that soul is infinitely good in the common understanding of all healthy and normal people in this world then he cannot abandon us he obviously does on earth it's obvious the things that people have to go through are unspeakable, unbelievable, and uh, incomprehensible. That I find proof by probability, again, that the soul must be eternal. Having an origin, obviously, but no end. If the one who supposedly is such a good being, and whom we could prove by logics to be necessarily so, somehow lets all these things happen then we have to come to the uh, again to the conclusion by the highest and only possible probability and plausibility that to him very obviously what happens here is of not that much an importance as to what will happen with this soul of ours The only thing I can conclude from this conclusion is that he must somehow let us know on what we have to do for this soul of ours. Whether the body will survive or not is another question. But the soul will survive. Therefore, there must be something that we'll have to do for this soul. And that's basically where it stops. Because you see, we can indeed conclude by plausibility and probability that there must be such a thing as revelation. We call it revelation. Well, obviously, uh, the one we cannot touch and cannot see is telling us something. So that's revealing something. There must be something like revelation. Could we, in the same not contradictable manner in which we prove the existence of the I am, ever prove that there is three who can say I am? Most definitely not. It's contradictory. We can give it a proof by plausibility, saying if he's infinitely good, and we always associate the good with love, and as we are created according to a pattern, there must be a reason why all people, all times, everywhere, associate good with love and love good. Sometimes the wrong good, but they don't love it because it's the wrong good, but because it's the wrong good. That love is impossible for somebody who cannot love on an equal basis. And therefore, you could say the only theory about the I am that makes any kind of sense 
is the one of saying there is three who can say I am, who are, however, the same. We cannot go further than that. If we were capable of going further than that, would the same totally, absolutely conclusive proof that there is what we call a Holy Trinity, we wouldn't need faith. There wouldn't be such a thing as the gift of faith. And Vatican I would have had to say, we can dogma, we can grasp and arrive at the recognition of the entire Catholic truth just by using the light of reason. Vatican I didn't do that. Vatican I said, God, yeah, the existence of God. Not more. However, when you consider what today is called proof, and what is accepted commonly under the term proof, then I can prove every single issue of the entire Catholic doctrine to you, including why the Church is the only uh, true Church in the world. Simple. We know, we do not suppose, we do not go by probability. We absolutely, most definitely know that the one who says I am is perfect, eternal, infinitely simple, and cannot change. It is most highly improbable that he never said anything to us about himself. That he keeps himself totally obscure from his own creatures. Why in the first place did he make those creatures? Why? If he never says a word to them. That's totally illogical and contradicts entirely the pattern of our thinking. The pattern of our thinking cannot be entirely different from the pattern of thinking of the one who perfectly well made us. Even though we are not perfect and perfectly well made, he perfectly well made us. If our pattern, if we have a certain pattern of thinking, and I'm talking about what most people believe everywhere and all the time, then that pattern must correspond to the one who made it. According to that, the one who made it loves us. You don't love somebody by staying silent. Not the human way of doing it, not the human way of conceiving the very term of love. He must have spoken to us. The next proof of probability that would uphold in a totally impartial court is that there's most definitely only one book that correctly represents the name of the one who made us. When totally contradicting grammar, therefore indicating the eternity, contradicting or at least contra juxtaposing time, says before Abraham was, I am, and says, uh, I'm, uh, I am who am. Ego sum qui sum in Latin. And who says when uh, Moses asks, and yeah, but what am I going to do to tell those people down there whom I talk to? Tell them you talk to the one qui est, who is. And, uh, an impartial court would have to give the benefit of doubt to that book that speaks in that way. Love cannot be uh, fully expressed to something inferior. That gives the benefit of doubt among all theories about God to the one about the uh, triune God, one of the same being in three persons. Only there, the creator of everything, can love on its own level without having to create something. Would God be perfect if he was only one person? Can God be perfect if he's only one person? We saw that by reasoning, he's not only eternal, but he must also be infinitely good and therefore be infinitely loving. Loving what? Infinitely loving what? Did he therefore need to create something to be loved? I reject that. I reject that as most highly improbable. 
I cannot prove it to you, but I reject that the uh, perfect love, the perfect good, in order to love what, whom, has to create somebody to be loved. Could it be infinite and perfect self-love? Yes, and it is. But again, love whom? Himself only? What do we, in our pattern of mind, for many thousand years, call that? Is that what we use the term love primarily for? No. In all the history of this patterned mankind, the term love was always used towards an object of love. And very rarely was anyone satisfied with naming that object as myself. You love something or somebody. And again, if we go according to the pattern that has been imprinted to the minds that were created by the primary superior mind, then we understand the term love, first of all, as a term going to something or somebody. If that is true, which I cannot conclusively prove to you, then only the Trinity makes sense. If uh, God was one person, as uh, the other religions claim, then he needed to create something to be to love. Or he made a mistake in that creation, giving us the wrong pattern imprint on our innocent thinking, that's very important, on our innocent thinking, by making us, understanding the term, innocently, as loving something or somebody, and not just ourselves. What has that got to do with the Catholic Church? Well, one thing must be absolutely sure, and that's something that I can prove to you absolutely and totally conclusively. If that I am talked to us, then he obviously gave us something of himself. That is unchangeable. We call it the truth. Whatever we call it, it is unchangeable. He is unchangeable, so that can't change. If it's unchangeable, and if it's one and the same, as there is only one I am for the moment, before we accept the Trinity, there's only one God, let's call it this way, there's only one God, he cannot change, he cannot lack anything, he cannot have anything added to him, he has never started, will never stop. Then whatever he tells us must be perfect, unchangeable, if he's speaking himself, like when he says, before Abraham was, I am, then that can never change. If that can never change, then there's only one truth. Somebody's got to have it. There is one group in this whole world that has the whole truth, and all others are in definite error. There is no way around that statement. That is definite proof. Is it proof of church? Not sufficient. We have the we have the, the the proof of plausibility and probability on many sides. Like I said before, there's only one book that names the name of God correctly. We have at the same time only one institution that, at least for a time span of eighteen hundred years, hardly ever changed anything in its pronouncements. And that's called the Catholic Church. Why is it that in that Catholic Church, if it has the truth, the very same group of people who said that human being with the light of his reason can detect the existence of God, which we have just proven, now that very same group of people said that miracles are necessary for salvation, which in the term of the skeptic would mean 
something that is according is that is against everything that we know is necessary for our minds to be somehow uh, kept for eternity. A very skeptic way of formulating the term miracles are necessary for salvation. Well, obviously, because there is no conclusive proof by reason. The very same I am who revealed something of himself to us decided, for whatever reason, not to give us enough in order to be able to arrive at the same conclusion without him. That is obvious. For those, however, who are not satisfied by this, not because of self-determination, but because of really looking for something, the truth, looking for the truth, he has given us help. Can I prove that that is the case? According to all modern accepted sciences, yes. Biochemistry doesn't even know how many substances are in here. Biochemistry will irrefutably prove to you that this is not blood. Biochemistry will also irrefutably prove to you that this is wine, may become vinegar, may evaporate, but cannot become blood, let alone human blood, and stay as fresh, coagulated human blood for 1300 years. Chemistry says, no, it's absolutely impossible. Physics say, that, no, that's absolutely impossible. Medicine says, well, medicine knows very little about human being, but medicine says, no, that's absolutely impossible. All so-called exact modern sciences say, no, I'm sorry, that is impossible. In the small and insignificant town of Lanciano, south of Rome, about, uh, if I remember well, 1200 or 1300 years ago, And obviously, uh, in his heart, innocent and honest priest, he was the local parish priest, if I remember well, had grave doubts about the Catholic doctrine of what is called the real presence of the body and the blood of our Lord on the altar. The Catholic Church teaches that whenever uh, a priest, in the, with the intention of saying Mass, and with the proper, uh, in the proper uh, frame of saying mass, has a piece of uh, white unleavened bread in front of him, and a glass of wine in front of him, and pronounces certain words over that glass of wine. Afterwards, the glass of wine still looks like a glass of wine, but supposedly, according to what uh, this Catholic Church teaches, is not wine anymore, but is the blood of the one who in that uh, above-mentioned book says, before Abraham was, I am. Of course, that is hard to believe. You hold a glass of wine in your hand, it looks like wine, it tastes like wine, and somebody says it isn't wine. That contradicts everything we know in modern science. But what happened 1200 years ago also contradicts everything that we know in modern science. There, the round piece of unleavened white bread became human flesh without ceasing to look like bread in the center of it. Outside, and it has been examined under the microscope by three uh, scientists who claimed to be atheists, therefore were not to be suspected of being Catholic devotionalists. They examined the whole thing under the microscope and they said this is the horizontal slice of a human heart. They determined the exact blood group 
And they said, it looks like it had been cut yesterday. And it was cut 1200 years ago. It also wasn't cut just as a horizontal slice of a human heart, but looking, looking on it on top, you have a sort of crown of real human flesh. They said horizontal slice of blood because there's both types of uh, muscles in it, lengthwise and across. And that's only in the human heart. But in the middle, as I said before, it still looks like the white host. That again is completely and totally impossible according to everything we know in modern science. Yet, it can be visited in that insignificant town of Lanciano, and somewhere there is a book with pictures, detailed description of that scientific research. The same is true for the blood in the chalice that has co coagulated, but is still fresh after 1300 years. We are faced with uh, something that contradicts the entire modern science, and in the most drastic possible way. It's not like uh, you are sick, you're having cancer, I put my hand on your body and instantly you're healed. There is no explanation for that either, yet. But biochemistry, at least biochemistry, and physics will tell you that there cannot be possibly anywhere ever an explanation for what I have just described. That I consider conclusive, irrefutable proof that the doctrine about the real presence of the body and the blood of our Lord on the altar in the Catholic Mass, or in the Mass, in Holy Mass, must be most positively true. Otherwise, that I am, we talked about, is absurd. And then we revert to the first question of all questions. Who was the first human being? Who was, uh, what was the first cell? What was the first piece of matter? When was the first universe? Who made the first universe going? Who made the first Big Bang going? I guess we will come to a plausible and probable conclusion that if you think the whole thing thoroughly well through, which one out of a million people might do, if you think it through all the way using that common sense, you have to become a Catholic or you have to lock yourself up in the rubber cell where all the paranoids and all the other maniacs go. In the end, you will necessarily have to conclude either the Catholic Church is right or nothing is right. I am not sure that this will present conclusive proof. If it uh, presented conclusive and irrefutable proof, and the church would be wrong about the doctrine of the gift of faith. However, face the logics of my initial thinking and face the miracle of Lanciano out of many other miracles, what conclusion can you come to? Well, if the faith is a gift, then with the help of God, you will be a Catholic. And I cheer for that.
aspirando previne za divan da prosekva kunkto na ostavoracijo da paracijo te sem prinčitel te te čepta finjata pe krestom domenom nostom amen sankte pije deči me ora po nobis I have given you an introduction on uh, the problems of the conciliar church, which I call the counterfeit church, since it assumes the name of Catholic church, uh, but does not have the right to claim to be Catholic, since it is a new church with a new doctrine and a new liturgy. Yesterday I gave an introduction to the new liturgy. Today I'm going to talk about Vatican II. That's where it all started. Well, it started in the last century, as you will, have, you will hear on the other tapes, but uh, Vatican II is the doctrinal basis of a new church. And uh, there is one general remark that I have to make about the entire Vatican Council. First of all, I personally, I underline, I personally do not believe because I say personally, because there's no papal pronouncement on it yet. I personally do not believe that Vatican II was an ecumenical council. For the simple reason that Vatican II had no intention of defining dogma. I have to remind you that all of the ecumenical councils in history, without a single exception, <coughs> had the intention of defining dogma, and all of them, with one exception, did. The Council of Lyon, never defined dogma because they just never got around to do it, but they wanted to. Third, there was never an ecumenical council called in unless there was a crisis of faith. Like the Council of Trent was called in after the uh, Lutheran reformers messed up the church in the northern countries. Vatican II was called in for no other reason but Pope John's inspiration. So that's no reason to call in an ecumenical council. Maybe I'm wrong with what I say in the sense that uh, it is the, uh, the council fathers and the pope who formally declare something to be an ecumenical council, but in that case it is certainly at least, to say the least, a very exceptional ecumenical council. It is also exceptional in another regard. It is the first council ever to pronounce heresy. Vatican II as a whole, is unacceptable to a Catholic. And after the talk, you will see why. Now, let's have... We, I, time does not permit me to go through all the details of Vatican II, so I will point out the most important errors and heresies. First of all, I have to do away with a, a mistake of interpretation. The first document of Vatican II, called Sacro Sanctum Concilium, is the Constitution on the Liturgy. Some people seem to believe that the new rite of mass that Paul VI issued in 1969 is against the will of the Council. It is not. The document, the first document of the Council, Sacro Sanctum Concilium, is formulated in a way that you can do with it whatever you want. The very same, in the very same document you find Number 22.2, giving to faculty, to the bishops' conferences, to have the, the Mass said in the uh, vernacular, and the bishops' conferences are allowed to decide on how far this may go, provided Rome's support. It doesn't say the Holy Father explicitly has to give permission. It only says provided that uh, the, the sacred congregation for the divine worship is in agreement. Uh, that's new, too. Until Vatican II, nobody was allowed to change anything in the liturgy whatsoever without explicit papal permission. And uh, Sacrosanctum Concilium suggests, makes a few suggestions, uh, like uh, they want unnecessary repetitions to be cancelled. This is why nowadays the Confidior is not said before communion anymore. This is why the Confidior uh, is not repeated by the people. In a, by, by the altar boys alternating with the priest, but the priest says it alone if he ever says it, because you have many options to that. Now, uh, Sacrosanctum Concilium says that the Latin language must be the language of the liturgy, and at the same time it says that parts of the Mass can be in the vernacular, 
And then it says, if the bishop's conference decides so, the whole of mass, the order of mass, the canon can be in the vernacular. So you see it's a, 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 a totally contradictory document. And here is uh, a very important thing that you ought to know for all the rest of what I'm going to talk about. Pius the, the Six in uh, 1799 condemned the Synod of Pistoia. Now that was uh, a, a, a thing that took place in 1786. A few bishops in the area of Pistoia in Italy came together and demanded some changes in the attitude of, the, uh, of Rome uh, towards uh, certain issues in the church. And they wanted uh, exactly what Vatican II issued. They wanted the liberty of religion. They wanted uh, a certain relaxing of the discipline and so on. Pius VI condemned the Synod of Pistoia, condemned their pronouncements, and in his uh, bull, Octorem Fide, he says, the purpose of a council is to clarify terms, not to come up with ambiguous terms. Vatican II is ambiguous from the first to the last line. Vatican II is contradictory from the first to the last line. But I cannot go into the contradictions of Vatican II in this short talk, so I will, give, I will point out the worst heresies. And let's start with the dogmatic constitution Lumen Gentium. Dogmatic in this context does not mean it's dogma, it means it's a constitution on teaching. It doesn't give pastoral advice, it is teaching. Which again is a lie, because both John the 23rd and Paul the 6th said this is a pastoral council, it is not a dogmatical council. But then they came up with two dogmatic constitutions, which do not define anything, do not bind the Catholic to accept it, but are dogmatic constitutions, that means constitutions on the doctrine of the church. And Lumen Gentium is the constitution on, lit on, on the Holy Church. Lumen Gentium is in heresy. Now you have to understand that as a Catholic you're not allowed to read books that contain heresy. Because in order to, uh, in order to make a book illicit as reading for a Catholic, it is not needed that the whole book is wrong. It is to totally sufficient that part of the book is wrong. So, uh, in the old days when you had a list of books that were prohibited to Catholics, which was called the Index, there were books on the Index that contained one wrong line. There was a very good translation of the Bible on the Index, the 1S translation of the Bible into the German, German language, because it contained two or three little errors. For all the rest, it was a very good translation. But because of two or three little errors, the book went on the index, didn't get the imprimatur, that means uh, the agreement of a bishop, and was prohibited to, uh, as reading to Catholics. Now Vatican II should be the first book on the index as far as this century is concerned. Because now, Lumen Gentium I. This is something you have to remember. Remember Lumen Gentium 1.8.15.16 easy to remember. 1, 8, 15, 16. Lumen Gentium 1 says the church in a way is in a way the sacrament of salvation concerning all people in the world. Now first of all the church is not a sacrament. We have the seven sacraments. The Council of Trent defined that we have seven sacraments. That's a definition, a dogmatic definition. And uh, you cannot possibly uh, make it plausible to me that Vatican II wanted to say, yes, but in a way containing all these seven sacraments, the Church is a sacrament of salvation. It is not. A sacrament and a sign. It's not. Because the Church is a perfect society. The Church has been defined as a perfect society and not a sign. A sacrament is a sign by definition. And uh, it certainly doesn't uh, concern all people, because those who reject the church are not subject to the church. The church is not interested in them unless they convert. The church does not judge them. The church does not deal with them. The church is not, they do not make part of the church. But Vatican II says something different. In Lumen Gentium 8, Vatican II says the church of Christ subsists in the Catholic church. 
The word subsists doesn't tell you much in English. It says, it says a lot in Latin. Subsister in Latin means something that is uh, lying underneath. That means uh, uh, the grass is subsistent to my way of walking. But it could also be subsistent to Father Trinchard's way of walking. And uh, not just to mine. So when you say that the Church of Christ subsists of the Catholic Church, that does not in, in exclude the Protestant churches. Vatican II is too intelligent to, to say, they were too clever to say that the church contains the Protestant churches and the Orthodox churches and all these other churches. But they said maybe those are churches con in, contained in the Catholic Church because they said the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. For Almost 2,000 years, the Catholic Church insisted that the Church of Jesus Christ is the Catholic Church. And it is defined dogma that the Church of Jesus Christ is the Catholic Church. It's identical with the Catholic Church. Nothing outside the Catholic Church is part of the Church of Christ. And nothing uh, of the Church of Christ is outside the Catholic Church. So the Catholic Church and the Church of Christ are identical. The Church that Christ founded. Christ founded the Catholic Church and no other church. Christ did not just found the Latin rites. We have other rites in the church. I mean ways of celebrating, ways of worship. But we have only one Catholic Church. And uh, I have to repeat this now for the third time. Uh, Pope Eugene IV in 1441 at the Council of Florence defined as dogma that nobody who is not subject to the Roman pontiff can ever be saved. He said that those who are schismatics and heretics cannot be saved, even if they for some reason believe they were shedding their blood for Christ. Now when I say they cannot be saved, when I say they cannot be saved, I mean objectively speaking they cannot be saved. There is no objective way that they could be saved. Subjectively speaking, as far as their person is concerned, we do not know if God will give them an extraordinary grace after death, if they have been honest during their lifetime here. But we do not know it. The church cannot speak about the dead. The church does not look into the hearts of people. It can't. The church has to judge according to external circumstances, to manifested formalities, to formal uh, manifestation of the faith and the formal manifestation of the faith is if you're a member of the Catholic Church and believe everything the church says and if you're subject to the Roman Pontiff and only if you are in the Catholic Church you have an objective chance of being saved this is what the dogma means now um, in uh, I will come back to that later in uh, Lumen Gentium 8 suddenly the Protestant churches make part of the Church of Christ. They do not make part of the Catholic Church, but they make part of the Church of Christ because the document says the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. Uh, excuse me, the Church it subsists to the Catholic Church. And uh, this comes to the point that Cardinal Ratzinger, abusing St. Thomas Aquinas in his quotation, being asked uh, if the, what, what that means, the Church of Christ subsists. Why doesn't the Council say the Church of Christ is the Catholic Church? Cardinal Ratzinger said, Oh, but the word subsists is much stronger than the word is. And that is an academic lie. He was quoting St. Thomas, but St. Thomas talks about God himself when he says, Subsist subsistentia est nobilissima forma essendi. That means subsistence is the most noble form of being. Only in God, because God, God is not in every single flower, but he subsists to every single flower. He subsists to every single being. He subsists to everything that is in existence. Because everything that is, you, me, this house, the plants out there, this planet, the whole universe, has its being from God. Even if man created it, it receives the being from God. Those, the New Orleans streetcars are created by man, but they receive their being from God because there cannot be anything without God 
who is being himself. I know this is kind of difficult for you, but uh, it's so difficult because it's the most simple thing in reality. Uh, now, when the Ratzinger quotes St. Thomas Aquinas in the wrong context, and this is the method of the council, as you will see later. You quote somebody, but you quote him in the wrong place. And that's a form of lying. You cannot deny that Lumen Gentium 8 makes it optional to believe if the Catholic Church is the only true church or if there can be other churches that have a chance to get you saved. No wonder no Protestants are converting anymore. The same Lumen Gentium 8, needless to say, talks about the fact that even the churches that do not have, uh, that are not in union with the Roman Pontiff, receive the Holy Spirit. That's another heresy. You can read in the Gospel of St. John that the Holy Spirit is given only to the Catholic Church. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit did not come to the Lutherans, to the future Lutherans. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit did not come to the old religions, the old pagan religions. The Holy Spirit came to the Catholic Church and to nobody else. It came to St. Peter, first of all, and the Apostles. So anybody who is separated from St. Peter's successor, the Pope, cannot receive the Holy Spirit. It's ridiculous. And when a Lutheran pastor baptizes an, an innocent child, and the innocent child dies baptized and goes to heaven, this innocent child does not go to heaven because it was baptized by a Lutheran pastor, but because a Lutheran pastor illicitly administered the Catholic sacrament of baptism. Is that clear? Now, in Lumen Gentium, I do not remember at the moment, I do not have the book, and Lumen Gentium 15, something that you should look up yourself, for this I recommend. From Flannery, the documents of Vatican II, do not buy the translation of the other guy with the red cover, buy the book with the blue book cover, because the other guy translates in, a, in an accommodating way. Uh, Lumen Gentium 6, 16 is something that you can entirely judge on your own. The Muslims, together with us, adore one merciful God. Together with us. That's a quotation. Musulmani nubiscum adorant unum deum misericordiosum, in Latin. I checked it in Latin to make sure that this heresy stands firm. It stands firm. Now where's the incarnation? Where's the Trinity? The Quran, the holy book of the Muslims, calls, I'm quoting the Quran, calls the idea of a holy trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, an excremental idea. I'm quoting the Quran, beg your pardon. And now Vatican II tells me that they, together with us, adore one merciful God. Now where's the first commandment? They have another God, they have Allah. The lonely one person, Allah. We have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the second person of God, the Son, become man. And the Word became flesh. At verbum caro factum est, at the last Gospel at Mass. Uh, I've never heard about Allah, that he would have become verbum. That, the, that the Allah would have become caro, the meat, the flesh. I've never heard that, that Allah assumed uh, uh, a human nature. And if you tell a Muslim that Allah uh, was incarnated on earth, he will kill you. And he is right from his viewpoint of religion. The Muslims are not as accommodating as the Catholics. And uh, God will probably bless many of them for, for, for merely that reason. Now the Vatican too tries to tell me that I pray together with the Muslims to the one merciful God. This is blasphemy. It is heresy and it is blasphemy. And the same Lumen Gentium 16 tells me that the Jews and I pray to the same God. The Jews explicitly reject the Incarnation. The Jews explicitly rejected the idea of the Blessed Trinity. And they call it names, believe me, in their books. And how? Not even I would quote that. And now Vatican II tells me we are all praying to the same God. Do you realize that a certain German author, Gotthold Elf Ephraim Lessing, in the 18th century, 
wrote a, a, a play called The Ring Parable, the, paral the Parable of the Ring, in which he has a representative of the Catholic Church, a representative of uh, the Muslims, and a representative of the Jewish faith, agreeing with each other that everything is the same anyway, because we pray to the same God. Gotthold Ephraim Lessing was a practicing and open Freemason. And here we have Vatican II, a so-called ecumenical council, repeating what Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, the admittedly open Freemason, said in his play. The idea, the concept, that the Muslims and the Jews pray into the same God as we do, which our present Pope repeats over and over again, this concept is heresy, it implies a lot of other heresies, and it is blasphemy. And anybody who tells me that we can interpret this in a Catholic way is, to say the least, a little bit nuts. I quote again, The Muslims, together with us, adore one merciful God. Now give me a Catholic interpretation of that. I don't think that even CNN could come up with an, a, a Catholic interpretation on that. And they are very good in making up excuses, lines, and other things. Whoops, I hope nobody will sue me. And um, this is uh, Lumen Gentium. There's other things in Lumen Gentium that cry out to heaven for being blasphemous, stupid, and heretical. But we have to go on. The next document concerned is Dignitatis Humanae. And I quoted it already in one of my former speeches, but now I have to quote it in the context again. Dignitatis Humanae number three says... And to make it easier for you to understand what I'm saying, I will quote the present Pope's interpretation of this line. Quote it from Catechesi Tradenda number 32. Quarum ope Spiritus Christi non apnuit salutem affere. For the efforts of which the Spirit of Christ does not deny to bring salvation. Whom does he talk about? He talks about the Protestant churches, the Pope does. That means, he says, for the, to the efforts of the Protestant churches, the Spirit of Christ does not deny salvation. Now get this. Is there anybody here who does not understand the distinction between subjective and objective? I presume so. Objective means you are concerned with the, the matter, the thing. Subjective means you are concerned with the person. That means with his conscience, with his intentions, with his view of things. The wine I'm drinking here is objectively an excellent wine. Subjectively, you might not like it all the same. Uh, some other soft drinks around here are objectively absolutely bad, but uh, you might like them subjectively. You understand? Now, uh, Vatican II and the present Pope talk about the Protestant churches, and they talk about the efforts of the Protestant churches. Now, if you tell me that it would be possible that a Protestant who has lived a just life all of his life, who has tried his best to find out the truth, who has tried his best to avoid sin, will not be sent to hell by God, I will say, I don't know, maybe. Through an extraordinary act of grace from God, or an act of, 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 of authentic contrition, he might actually die as a member of the Catholic Church without knowing but wanting to do so. That's possible. We cannot exclude it, subjectively speaking. Objectively speaking, if anybody says that the efforts of the Protestant Church, and remember what I said about the innocent child being baptized in a stolen sacrament, anybody who says that the efforts of Protestant churches can save a soul is a heretic. Dignitatis Humanae of Vatican II, and the present Pope says it, so the present Pope is a heretic. We have discussed the question if that makes him seize the Pope or not. It doesn't. He's still the Pope. He's a bad Pope. He's a heretical Pope, an ignorant Pope, and a Pope who lies. But that doesn't make him seize to be Pope, just like the Archbishop of New Orleans is not exactly what you call a Catholic Bishop, but he's the Bishop of New Orleans. And President Clinton is the Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces in this country, even though he's a draft dodger. Amen. Thank you. And uh, excuse me, I was talking about uh, uh, President Clinton. Her husband is a draft dodger. Um, uh, 
Now, uh, the efforts of the Protestant churches cannot save anybody. They cannot save anything. The efforts of the Protestant churches can only bring you down to hell. Because the efforts of the Protestant churches are heretical efforts, objectively speaking, I do not condemn the poor pastor. And in this regard, I should mention to you that in St. Thomas Church in New York, Episcopalian, I found the best sermon on the devil in a long time. Not in St. Patrick's. However, Christ was never substantially present in the beautiful, beautiful, beautiful St. Thomas Church in 52nd Street, 5th Avenue in New York. And except for baptism, there was no sacrament given there ever. You do not receive uh, confirmation in St. Thomas. You cannot go to confession in St. Thomas. You cannot save your soul in St. Thomas Church, not objectively speaking. You understand when I say not objectively speaking? This is very important. So, dignitatis humane, number three, is heretical. So the whole document is heretical. So the whole council is heretical. The next thing, in De Verbum, De Verbum is the document, and it's called a, dog a dogmatic constitution. De Verbum is the document on the interpretation of Holy Scripture. And there, with the impertinence of quoting De Filius of First Vatican II, they redefine the term of tradition. Now Vatican I, did I say Vatican II or Vatican I? Vatican II has the gall to uh, quote Vatican I on its own reinterpretation of tradition. The first Vatican Council last century on the Pius IX, the first Vatican Council defined dogma, defined tradition as everything that has been handed down to us, including the uh, written tradition, that means Holy Scripture, and oral tradition, and that means everything the apostles heard to come out of the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Period. That's tradition. Some things in oral tradition we do not yet fully know. That's not a development of tradition. Tradition is there. Like uh, the apostles knew that Our Lady was immaculately conceived. It became a dogma only in 1854. The apostles knew that Our Lady was assumed into heaven with her body. It became a dogma only in 1950. That's not a development of tradition. This is just finding tradition which is there and defining tradition which is there. So I repeat, Vatican I, the first Vatican Council, which was a true council, the first Vatican Council said there is two sources of the faith, Holy Scripture and tradition. And tradition, the oral tradition, is exactly what I was talking about. Everything received from the words of our Lord Jesus, or from the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now, Vatican II says there is a growth in tradition. That means tradition is developed under the influence of the faithful's study and their religious experiences. Get this. Now suddenly we do not need Holy Scripture anymore. Suddenly we do not need the popes anymore who interpret Holy Scripture and what has been handed down to us from one pope to the other. Suddenly we have the faithful involved with their religious experiences and with their own studies. You cannot possibly imagine how much I give on the people's studies and their religious experiences, even if they are clergy and especially when they are clergy. So this is the new de definition of tradition. By the way, parenthesis, the famous document De Verbum of 1988, in which the Pope uh, uh, fakes to uh, uh, want uh, the old mass to be said. The Pope is a liar because a year after that he said he doesn't, li he doesn't like the fact that so many people are still, uh, still, still attached to those forms of worship. He meant the old mass. 
he said that a year after he issued Ecclesia Dei telling the bishops that they should give wide and generous permission for the old mass. That goes to show you the honesty of the man. Uh, in Ecclesia Dei, he criticizes Archbishop Lefebvre for his view on tradition. Now, Archbishop Lefebvre, I read everything he ever wrote. Archbishop Lefebvre was a very unoriginal man as far as doctrine is concerned. I have never heard anything out of the mouth of Archbishop Lefebvre that would be in any way new to me. Unless I hadn't studied well my theology before that. Archbishop Lefebvre, as far as his theological pronouncements are concerned, was entirely unoriginal. Because he was totally and completely faithful to the doctrine of the church. With absolutely no exception whatsoever. And he quoted the First Vatican Council and said, Tradition is what the apostles heard coming from the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ and has, which has been handed down to us by the popes. And then uh, the present pope accuses Archbishop Lefebvre of a wrong understanding of tradition, quoting De Verbum number 8. We have to say more about that. The experience of the faithful and their personal studies are adding to the growth of tradition. Thanks, but no thanks. Next. The entire document, Gaudium et Spes, that's the document on the church in the modern world, was written by the found, was written in a sense, not directly, but indirectly, written by the founder of the Opus Dei, the so-called, because he isn't, the so-called Blessed Jose Maria Escrivá de Balaguer, who wanted the church to be a society based on the laity, a concept that has been condemned by Pius X in his encyclical on modernism. He wanted the church to conform to the modern world, and he wanted a one-world government. Gaudium et Spes, in number 12, utters blasphemy when it says, all the religions of this world, the non-Christian and the Christian religion, agree with us that all religious efforts and all the efforts of the church are directed towards man. That's the literal quotation. Directed towards man. Sounds familiar to the one who has read about the Masons. Sounds familiar to the one who has read about blasphemies uttered at the United Nations or at the Presidio. Doesn't it? Now to say that all the efforts of the church are directed towards man is heresy and blasphemy. All the efforts of the church are directed towards God in reality. Now the old mass says so. The new mass, eh, not sure. Gaudium et Space also postulates, as I said before, a peaceful government of the whole world under one body of government. Mm. This is to say the least naive in 1965, when most of the governments on this, in this world were already anti-clerical and against the church. It is to, to, to say the least naive. I do not believe for a moment that it is naive. I believe it's diabolical. And I do recommend to you to buy this book on Vatican II. And if you write to me, I will give you all the numbers concerned. It doesn't cost me much time. It's some 40 numbers, something like that, all through the council. You read those numbers, then you know exactly why the conciliar church is not the Catholic church, but the counterfeit church. You just read Vatican II, on which they are based. Another thing about Vatican II, I, uh, there is no need to quote uh, the wonderful uh, document on religious liberty. Please do not call it religious freedom. In this country, the words freedom and liberty are usually confused, not only by the Democrats as usual, but also by the Republicans, unfortunately. Freedom is a good thing. Liberty is a bad thing. Freedom means you have the freedom to do what you have to do. Liberty means you are at liberty to do what you want. And that's not liberty, but slavery of sin. St. Paul says that, not I. 
So as long as the Statue of Liberty is not the Statue of Freedom, I'm not interested in the old broad in New York Harbor. Uh, we talk about the liberty of religion. And the liberty of religion is something in Vatican II that caused many bishops to stop signing documents. Because Vatican II, in, uh, I always forget the name of the document. There are such crazy names and titles. What's the one on religious liberty? Um, um, I can't remember it right now, I'm sorry. I should have brought the book, but uh, you can find it easily. If the one who has the book, just check uh, in the index under religious freedom or, or freedom of religion or liberty of religion, whatever they call it. Liberty of religion has been condemned by the popes, Gregory the 16th, Pius the 9th, Leo the 13th, Pius the 10th, Pius the 11th, Pius the 12th. You are not free to choose your religion. You are bound in conscience to choose the Catholic Church and to belong to the Catholic Church. And if you don't, as the Church says it, objectively speaking, you cannot be saved. The Church cannot condemn anybody into hell, not even uh, Judas Iscariot. There's no pronouncement on him ever. So anybody who thinks that he's free to choose the religion might go to hell for it. See, if I was free to choose my religion in this country, I would join with the Episcopalians. They have nicer churches, but they have a better salary. I could marry. I could still say, uh, even if in English, a beautiful form of Mass in St. Thomas Church. And it's not Mass, but, but, but who cares? Uh, in St. Thomas Church, they say the evening service with the, the veil over the chalice and the burrs and the missiles on the epistle side and the altar is facing God. And what an altar! Whoo! Beautiful, one of the most beautiful neo-Gothic altars I've ever seen. And the priest is nicely dressed, and when he gives a sermon, he gives a sermon that reminds you of your duties towards God, of your uh, duty to avoid sin. He talks about you must save your soul. He talks about the glory of the Blessed Trinity. He doesn't talk about Nicaragua. He doesn't talk about the economically disadvantaged. He doesn't talk about the poor people in prison. He doesn't talk about all of that and that and that. He talks about God and our, our duty to save our souls. If I had the freedom of religion, I'd been an Episcopalian for many years already. But I do not have it. I am bound in conscience to adore God in the way that God wants me to adore Him. And that means I have to be a Catholic even if it costs me my life. There is no such thing as liberty of religion. Forget it. Forget Vatican II. Let's print a bumper sticker. Forget Vatican II. Now one last short comment on our dear present Pope. I'm going to quote only one encyclical, and you will be astonished. His first encyclical. It's an old tradition, the Pope's first encyclical is the most important encyclical, because in the first encyclical the Pope says what is going to be his program for his pontificate. His first encyclical is called Redemptor Hominis, the Redeemer of Man. Mind you, not the Redeemer of Men, plural, but the Redeemer of M-A-N, of Man. Undefined, everybody therefore. In this document, apart from the fact that the document is truckloads of you know what, uh, in his document, he never ever uses the term Roman Catholic or Catholic Church. He speaks about the conscience of the church. That sounds like one of those TV preachers, right? The conscience of the church. He talks about the church of the, of the new advent. I don't know what the New Advent is, probably referring to his constant uh, references to the year 2000. Well, he will find out to the different. I know that the year 2000 is not going to make a change to anybody, just because it's a two with three zeros. Uh, who cares? And uh, in his document, number 10, second line, he utters the following statement. The amazement about the value and dignity of man is called the good news, the gospel. 
It is also called Krishnanism. I repeat, the amazement about the value and the dignity of the human being or man is called the good news or the gospel. It is also called Christianism. Vocatur item Christianismus. In the German translation of this encyclical that I have, the translator was so ashamed of this that he left out the word, it is also called Christianism. He just left it out in the German translation. Vocatur enim Christianismus. He just left it out. And I checked the, I don't remember, I haven't memorized it, but I checked the, the Latin original, and you always have to interpret church documents according to the Latin original, not the Polish original, okay? Uh, because the Latin original will be used by future popes, not the Polish original. So the, uh, uh, the, the, the Latin original is correctly translated the way I do. So I repeat this astonishing line. The amazement about the value and the dignity of man is called the, uh, the, the good news, the gospel, it's also called Christianism. That's blasphemy. That's absolute and total blasphemy. St. Pius X said, the only dignity of man is in his being a Catholic. That's the only dignity in him. The only dignity of man that I have is in my being a Catholic and a Catholic priest, not in my being Gregory Hesse. And in the same encyclical, and with this I conclude because I'm sick and tired of it, in this same encyclical, the Pope says, with the incarnation of Christ, man has been revealed to himself. Wow. He's only quoting Gaudium at space number 22. Man has been revealed to himself. Until this Pope taught me uh, to forget my old faith, I had, I had always believed that the New Testament was who had revealed the Son and the Holy Spirit to us. I always thought that the, 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 the message of the New Testament was revealing the Son, the Incarnation, and the Holy Spirit. And this Pope tells me man has been revealed to himself. I think he was in India for too long. That's why people went in the 60s to find themselves. Yeah. Yay! So what we have here, all together, is not only a new church, it is a Gnostic sect. Look up in the dictionary the word G-N-O-S-T-I-C. Look it up in the dictionary. Gnostic. Gnostic. It comes from Gnosis. Erkenntnis. No. Enlightenment. The word, uh, there, is no, there is no good translation in English for the word Gnosis. There is only one in, in, not even in Italian. Erkenntnis in German. Sometimes in psychology, modern psychology, even in the English language, the word Erkenntnis is used for that reason because there is no proper term in English. It's uh, the fact that you realize something. But there's no word for the realization, but that's, I don't think that's good English. So that's Gnosis. Now, a, a Gnostic sect, I don't have to explain to you what a sect is. You know about the Jehovah Witnesses. I like them much more than the, the, the new church because the Jehovah Witnesses at least try to mission to, to convert other people, which personally, subjectively speaking, is a nice effort. Now, uh, in, modern, in the modern church, they will tell you uh, uh, to join another religion uh, instead. So, an uh, agnostic sect is a sect that believes that man is the superior being, and only uh, the recognition of things in our brain is what counts. Which means you have a purely subjective religion, which means you make your own religion, and which means you can do whatever you want, it'll be fine. That'd be nice. As Gilbert Keith Chesterton said, if I was not a Catholic, I would have a harem. <laughs> so, uh, you, can, you see how absurd, you see the absurdity of things. We are living in a Gnostic sect founded by Vatican II, which our dear beloved present Pope calls the Second Pentecost. And I cannot say amen to that. I disagree with him, he's a heretic, I reject his teachings, I do not reject his papacy, I reject what he does in his papacy, and I reject what he says, period. Questions and answers. You said it all. I, I
I think that question is on yesterday's tape, so I, I can answer briefly now. Uh, you must not go to the new mass, because the new mass is against the will of the church, against the will of God, it's against divine law. It is an illegal right, illicit. It's not only against divine law, it's against eternal law, too. Eternal law is first, then divine law, as, an, as his own interpretation of his own eternal law, and then uh, positive law, natural law, and then positive law. It's against, it's against positive law pronounced by Pius V, it's against the uh, natural law uh, as the tradition of the church, and it's against divine law as the dogma of the Council of Trent, and it's against eternal law, therefore. You cannot attend the Novus Ordo Mass unless you have to for social purposes, uh, like you did, and in this case you do not say amen, because amen does not mean all right, it's okay. Amen means yes, yes, yes. You can't say yes to the new Mass. The new Mass does not represent the Catholic faith, but uh, yesterday's conference, uh, I, can, I can give you more information on that later on. But now as the camera is running. Humanly speaking, zilch, zero, rien, nada, nix, nichts, gar nichts, ničevo, niente. Thank you. Humanly speaking, I, 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 God has to work a miracle, but I mean, I don't know if God will, want, will, will work a miracle. He might end the world. I don't know. I don't know. I ain't no prophet. I'm not judging people who do not know. You, you cannot commit a sin if you don't know. Sometimes ignorance is a sin, but not the thing you do because of ignorance. You what? I call it the nervous disorder. Very good, yeah. You should call it the nervous disorder. <laughs> I'm walking with, without a chip on my shoulder, going no. off with a chip on my shoulder. It's a, absolutely, yeah. Radically yeah. Okay. Well, it's a disorder, but we talked about that yesterday. Uh, is uh, everything I told you about Vatican II so crystal clear that there are no questions? I doubt that. Don't be afraid of asking a stupid question. Only the one who laughs about a stupid question is stupid. Well, um, I know that several cardinals were Masons. Uh, I don't know about living cardinals. I have no information on that. I, I doubt there is no there, I doubt there is no Mason among the cardinals, but I don't know how many. Uh, I know several cardinals were Masons. There's no sense in naming names here. Most of them you won't know anyway. And uh, I know that the Masons have uh, tried already in the last century to infiltrate the church, and they succeeded because. Pope Leo XIII's Secretary of State was a Mason, but this I have said in my first conference, you will have it on tape. And uh, as far as the infiltration of the church is concerned, I can give you an information which I did not mention, I forgot, uh, the day before yesterday. In, nine, in the 1930s, Stalin started already to insert KGB agents into Western seminaries. And in 1974, NATO, in its annual report, not the report you could buy at the newspaper stand, but uh, the report that fortunately I got to see, uh, estimated uh, 3,000 KGB agents to be found among the Catholic hierarchy, that means priests and bishops. 3,000 KGB agents. NATO in 1974. Don't kill me if it was 76, but I think it was 74. Of course there are KGB agents in the Vatican. You think the KGB is stupid? The KGB is not the CIA. Christians in action. That's the field term for them. And uh, the infiltration must be deep down. Yes? Yeah. As a yes. Of, yes. Uh, of yes. 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 Of the of, of the real presence of the real presence of our Lord in the in the Eucharist. Yes. I, I, yes. I it yes. It is. It is. It is. And it is. It's very typical, Martin Luther, because uh, it's not typical Cranmer. Now Cranmer permitted communion in the hand, but he did not allow the communicant to stand. Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, the founder of the Anglican Rite. 
He insisted on the communicant kneeling because he believed it was symbolic bread that could, could contain, like a can, you know, contain Christ for those who believe in it. Luther insisted fully and totally on the meal. This is why the Novus Ordo Church doesn't have an altar. It has a buffet table. <laughs> yeah, Luther said so. The Herr Dr. Martin Luther said, an altar is for a sacrifice, a table is for a meal. And now we have the Catholic churches with tables, including St. Peter's Basilica now, not the papal altar. The papal altar can't be changed, can't be turned around. That's a different thing. I would have to give a special lecture on old altars of basilicas in Rome. There, were ne there was never in the history an altar facing the people. The altar always went toward the east. Yes, right. So if the apse of a church had to be built in the west, then the altar had to be turned around. Okay, but in St. Peter's Basilica, in the apse of St. Peter's Basilica, at the chair of St. Peter's, where I was ordained, uh, right there, now they have taken away, they have covered up the old altar facing God, and they have what I call encrusted spaghetti, the new altar. It looks like encrusted and, and colored spaghetti. And uh, that's the new altar there. In Florida, I went to my daughter to one of and I said, this is in the church, Mr. Tabernacle. She says, back there, 10 feet from the back door. Yeah. Only in bishops' churches in the old days, that, that's what it had to be, for the simple reason that when a bishop celebrates a pontifical high mass, the blessed sacrament must not be on the altar. This is symbolic because the bishop fully represents Christ. I only partially represent Christ. I'm not a full priest. I'm a priest good enough for saying mass. I'm not a priest good enough for making priests. These hands are not fertile. I cannot have children, priests, I mean. Otherwise I could, but I cannot have children, right? I, these hands cannot consecrate, so I'm not a full priest. And uh, the bishop, when he celebrates, especially the bishop of his diocese, uh, on the altar has seven candle holders, like the old menorah. There's not the six candles, but there's a seventh candle put up in front of the cross in the center, because now he's the, he's the full priest, the high priest the bishop of his own diocese. And the bishop of his own diocese, therefore, does not have the Blessed Sacrament on his altar, but in the chapel, a cathedral always has a chapel of the Blessed Sacrament. So nobody could complain about the fact that St. Pat Patrick's Basilica in New St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York does not have the Blessed Sacrament on the, on the high altar. That's normal, that's right, because it's, it's, uh, it's an Episcopal church, uh, not Episcopalian, it's uh, the church of the bishop, it's a cathedral. And, but a regular parish church has to have the Blessed Sacrament in the center of the church and not somewhere shoved away. Okay. But this is what the conciliar church thinks about the Blessed Sacrament. And again, it shows because it's part of liturgy. Well, anyway, the point is, the point is you, you cannot fulfill your Sunday obligation at the new Mass. You must not attend the new Mass and you must not collaborate with them. Would you work for the local Episcopalian church? No, I'm asking her. Would you work for the local Episcopalian? No, why not? They're much better than what you're working for. Huh? I prefer the Episcopalians ten times over, even if they got a bishop rest in Boston now, but who cares? I don't, no, 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 no. I, I, I didn't say that. Oh, be careful. Be very careful with what you say. If a modern priest... No matter what language he uses, no matter what ritual he uses, if a modern priest has the intention to baptize a child into the Catholic Church for the forgiving of the original sin, and if he says so, then the baptism is valid, as the baptism of a Muslim right out on the highway would be valid. If I have an accident on the highway and there's a guy with me in the car who is not baptized, and the only one pa passing by is an Arab with a towel head, uh, and uh, I want somebody, I can't move, I'm right there in the car, and this guy right next to me says, Father, please baptize me, I think I'm going to die. I would have to wait until somebody shows up, and I would ask the, this Muslim uh, to find me the, the Toymus bottle with water back there and baptize the guy next to me. The church has said everybody can baptize, unless he does not have the intention to do what the church does. Now, when an Arab in a towel head, a tow an, an old towel head, says, uh, you good men, I do what you want, then he wants to do what the church does. He doesn't know what the church does, but he wants to do what I want, and what I want is what the church does. Uh, so he wants to do what the church does. This is the old teaching of the church, that's not new. 
So uh, unless the, the forgiving of the uh, original sin is excluded, uh, it's valid. If a new priest says, you're hereby received in our community, and I congratulate you, and therefore I receive you right here, and I baptize you in the name of Christ, this is not valid baptism. Because baptism is not a reception into a community. Baptism, the, the, the essential of baptism is to get rid of our original sin. All of our yes. De- All of our perfect agreement. The church is in perfect agreement. The deacon can baptize. The deacon always could baptize. And the deacon always could solemnly baptize. In the Noah Ardo. In the Noah Ardo. He doesn't know our culture too well. Oh, we need to ask that question. He's not a deacon. He's not a deacon. He's a deacon that's been. In the Noah Ardo. He's a man of the community. Yeah, but yeah, oh, oh, wait a second. Again, it, uh, 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 that has nothing to do with the culture here. Uh, it, uh, again, the question is, is he a valid or ordained deacon? I don't know. I don't know. But uh, uh, again, again, listen, I told you before, we are talking about two different things here. Even if he isn't, even if he isn't. He could, he could of course, we, we, we must not confuse, we must not confuse licitness and validity. Who's talking here, I or you? <laughs> okay, now, we are not talking about licitness, we're talking about validity. I just told you, anybody, anybody, a woman too, even a woman can baptize. Yeah, well, if, oh, there you go. What I'm saying is this, uh, the baptismal manual that we have in the and they have no intention of doing what the church does, mostly. Exactly. That's what I said. If you use one of those books, and one of those books tells you you're receiving somebody into a club, there is no baptism. Huh? But if that deacon, let's say, is a better man than his ritual, and uh, uh, using the liberty uh, of, of, of liturgy in our days, uh, uses, has, has the, the manual right there, but he says, uh, we receive this beautiful child here into the church because, and we baptize this church, this, this beautiful child, because it has to get rid of original sin, then baptism is valid. Baptism, not mass. Baptism. My daughter told me last week, it's just in church. They baptize, they make their first and they confirmation all at one time. They got to do it anyway. Uh, that's illicit, but it's not, not necessarily invalid. Depends what they say. Baptism is always valid when the original, the, the extermination of original sin is not excluded, is implicit. Does it matter if they define original sin in a different way? Yes, it matters if the, the Yes, yes, yes. That, that's the trouble. Yeah, if original I, sin is not seen as a spiritual. Teaching the, teach, the religion teachers, so I don't know what they do in the seminary, they teach the religion teachers that the original sin is not a previously perceived, but as something that you're born into is something like the environment. Well, the exact words of it's a condition of the world. Yeah. And you can't get rid of the condition of the world by one child being right. That's why we have to protect the spotted owls. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, collect the whole collection. Going back to the man, give me your opinion, give us your opinion of Mother Angelica. Who? Mother Angelica. I don't follow these things. I'm not interested in what happens out there. Yeah, I, I'm not interested in what they do. Oh, it's a woman, Madame Angelica. And she says mass. Oh, it's Novus Ordo. Hey, wait a second. This is quiet. Shut up. <laughs> what's the, what's the Madame Angelica mess? Is Novus Ordo? Yes. Well, what I said about Novus Ordo? Okay, it might be valid. It might not be. I would have to hear it and judge it. And then I'm not the Holy Office either. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, the, the, the new mess, if the new mess, if the new mass is said strictly to the book, strictly to the book in Latin, strictly to the book. Uh, yeah, well, uh, if it is strictly to the book, said in Latin, by, uh, by, wait a second, if it is strictly to the book, if the man who uh, celebrates the Mass 
has been ordained strictly to the book, leaving nothing out, changing nothing, then I consider it valid. No, she does not. See, the thing is, the thing is, what, what you miss, no, no, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not contesting the validity here, but it's not an issue. The validity is not an issue in that case, because the, uh, generally speaking, the validity of the new mass is of no concern to us. Why? The, author, the Russian Orthodox Mass is valid. You still can't go there. The Russian Orthodox Mass is, uh, is an insult to God because it's celebrated by a priest who rejects the papal infallibility and the primacy of the Pope. But the Russian Orthodox Mass is valid. The Greek Orthodox Mass, they are heretics and schismatics, but the Greek Orthodox Mass is always valid. I'm not interested, basically, if the new, if the new Mass is valid or not. The reason why I tell you do not go to communion in the new church is because you do not know and you are, you are bound by the church to follow the safer course. That means go to St. Pius X. You're not allowed to go to the new mass. But if the new mass is, if Mother Angelica's mass is valid or not, I don't care. Whatever they do there, it's against the will of God, it's against the will of the Council of Trent, it's against the will of St. Pius V, it's against divine law, it's against eternal law. What are you concerned with? Why do you break your head over something that is in, illicit anyway? Yeah, but it isn't. You no. see? No. no. It's a once and for all. It is not. It is not. Right. No, that's not my opinion. This is the opinion of the Council of Trent. Right. The Council of Trent in the seventh session, Canon 13, said, whoever says that any of the pastors, that includes the Pope, any of the pastors, Whoever says that any of the pastors may add on to liturgy, subtract from liturgy, or uh, uh, write up a new liturgy, anathema said. In the new mass? Did you follow it with the old missile? Did you follow it with the old missile in your hand? I have Oh. With the traditional missile? Yes. With the traditional missile? Do Does the priest say, Intuiba Dr. Taridea, Dem Great even to the man? Yes. Okay. Is it the old mass there? No. Uh, so what? what well, you just got to use Father's criteria, which is, yeah. otherwise, if he's yeah. saying the true mass, yeah. problem. Yeah. If he says the true mass, fine. But if he what, doesn't, then it's I not. Mean, yeah. But from what I hear, she just adds a little whack to fool the people. Right. 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 It's not just a consecration. No, it's not just a consecration. It's a whole yeah, it must have whole There are some of them that are really go right from the beginning to the end. No, no, no. no I, I, I would have heard of that. Next question. Yeah, well, you've got the criteria and uh, check, check with the old missile and that will give you the answer. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's going on in Mother Angelica's mass. So I can only answer in principle, okay? Yes. Every time that I have seen Mother Angelica's mass, the Latin is at the beginning. The consecration comes in English. Three priests are on the altar to try for consecration. The consecration is in English, and the words used are for all. The new translation. That's the new mass. Yeah. Definitely the new mass. That's definitely the new mass, and therefore I'm not interested if it's valid or not because it's illicit in any case. I'll have to say more then. Yeah, it's against the divine law in any case. That's what's yeah. good about those buttons. Yeah. You can turn it off. The what? That's what's good about the buttons. You can turn them off. Oh, I would never switch it on. I mean, I watch good movies. Yeah. I would never, I never, never watch a mass on TV. I just, I, I prefer a good movie. Give me, give me Red October any time. But they're such beautiful priests. They're so beautiful priests. I prefer beautiful girls. Uh, go ahead. That reminds me of this. We had this old Dutch priest. We're not talking about. We're not speaking of the outer appearance of the priest. I'm speaking of the inner manner. Oh, maybe the maybe maybe they're almost maybe they're almost saints, but what they do is against divine law. Yeah. See, I'm a rotten bum, but what I do at Mass is not against divine law. Excuse me? What order are you? I'm diocesan. Diocesan? Yep, I'm diocesan. I think you want to notice your bishop. <laughs> you are bishop? No, no, that is bishop, so you oh. can report him. <laughs> <laughs>
Report me, you'll have fun. I wanted to ask you, in Europe, they have all the Nova Florida, also all over Europe. They have the, the, they have the Nova's Order all over the world, and the Nova's Order has been introduced into the Eastern countries, which is one of the beautiful results of the so-called opening in 89. In, 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 in Brim, in Czechoslovakia, I could see how far they've gone with the Novus Ordo, because uh, in a beautiful church, I think it's St. Thomas Church in uh, Brim, uh, they had an evening mass, maybe it was an evening service, in Czech, with a new mass in Czech, with an altar, a so-called altar facing the people, which means with the usual gourmet uh, table, the usual gourmet dining table and uh, buffet table, and uh, gorgeous Czech blondes at medium age, 21, uh, in tight-fitting dress, were singing for the mass. St. Thomas in Brynn, if you want to go there. <laughs> so they have been full of Novus Ordo sized. Yeah, fully Novus Ordo sized. Yeah. And the Cardinal, of, the Cardinal Archbishop of Prague is a modernist to the core. Yeah. It took 30 years for this Yeah, it took 2,000 years to build the church uh, to the point where it was, and it took 30 years for them almost to tear it down. But rest assured, we will survive, thanks to the Society of St. Pius X. Yeah. And Fatima, don't you think that Fatima also predicts that the third secret is what's going on today, though? Uh, well, I cannot give you a definite answer on that. I haven't read it, but this is the only, the only logical answer. It's the only logical answer, but sometimes logics are not the answer. I have to be diplomatic on that. I don't know. Do you believe in Fatima? Hmm? Do you believe in Fatima? I sure believe in something that was approved by a miracle that has been seen by 70,000 people and by some other people uh, in 15 miles distance from the place where the miracle took place. This is the only reason why I believe in Fatima, because principally I'm against visions, against apparitions, and against miracles. I do not believe them until they're approved. I give you one example. This is interesting to know for you. Saint uh, uh, Saint Catherine Labore. She was the one with the miraculous, yes, yes. miraculous medal. Saint Catherine Labore had apparitions from Our Lady. Uh, I believe they're true for one reason. There is one incident in the evening, in the late afternoon. Saint Catherine Labore had another apparition from Our Lady. Our Lady was sitting in a chair. Saint Catherine Labore knelt with her hands in the lap of Our Lady, imagine, and they had a nice conversation. And then the bells rang for Vespers. Now you know nuns are supposed to attend Vespers, okay? The bells rang for Vespers, and St. Catherine of Paris got up and said to Our Lady, I'm sorry, I have to go, and went to Vespers and let Our Lady sit there. Oh, oh. So you don't believe The that. next day, the next day, Our Lady came back and said to St. Catherine of Paris, if you had not gone, not gone to Vespers as you are commanded to last night, I would not have been allowed to come back. Oh. That should teach you something. No, that, that's definitely authentic. That is authentic. Because uh, that's the whole point. You see, most of the apparitions go against the church teaching. That crazy lunatic down there in northern Italy called uh, Don Gobbi with the Marian movement, who supposedly has Our Lady appearing to him for many years already. Don Gobbi. Oh, if you don't know him. Gobbi. Don Gobbi. Yeah. Stefano Gobbi. Yeah. And uh, Don Stefano Gobbi is as, uh, as authentic as a Diet Coke. And uh, he is... He, he is... But Diet Coke is not Coke, come on. Uh, he is as authentic as a Diet Coke because uh, he claims to have apparitions from Our Lady and visions and whisperings from her, but he endorses the New Mass and the Ecumenical Movement. And, now he changes. and in Medjugorje, something similar happens. Well, Medjugorje is a business fraud anyway. So, uh, Medjugorje was started by a couple of youngsters who wanted to make a joke, and two greedy Franciscans found out how you can make money that way. Franciscans always know how to make money, believe me. And uh, Medjugorje is not authentic because, first of all, Our Lady uh, says the rosary there. That means Our Lady says the Hail Mary. Our Lady cannot say the Hail Mary. Really? No, of course not. Imagine. How can Our Lady say pray for us sinners? That would be blasphemy. 
No, she never was. Huh? And uh, uh, so Medjugorje's fraud. Look, look in, 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 in Bayside, our lady, quote unquote, said that the uh, uh, unknown flying, flying objects, the flying saucers, are vehicles for the demons. According to my theology, a demon doesn't need a vehicle. <laughs> and he has no driver's license. He has no driver's license. He has no pilot's license. Why can't you get more free to be like you? Why can't we get... Don't say that it's against the rule of humility of St. Benedict. Do not praise me in public. If you say to me in private, I say, thanks, madam. <laughs> well, what can we do to, do, to help... Make everybody in the United States subscribe to the Angelos. This is what you can do. Hey, you wanted to know what you can do? Make everybody in the United States subscribe to the Angelos. This is what you can do. Society of St. Pius X Chapel. Yeah. yeah. Subscribe to the Angelos. That's all I can tell you. And never forget, never forget one thing. Because I know how people, how demanding people are, especially nowadays. Everybody wants to have his own priest, a priest to his liking. Don't. You have no right to. You have no right to. How do we get our young children, our teenagers, and our thirty? Let them read the. Read, let them read the. Uh, the what they is it called? They look at TV. Yeah. Show them these tapes. If they, if they, if, if, if the only perception left to these poor children is visual, uh, let them uh, have my tape. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and as far as the Society of St. Pius X is concerned, I will never get tired of reminding people of the fact sometimes it could happen to you that you have a personal experience of lesser enjoyability, uh, this political rector, uh, with uh, one of the priests of the Society of St. Pius X. Do not be disillusioned. Do not stay away. In the old, in the old days, in the last century, not every parish priest was a joy. And yet you went to his Sunday Mass, right? So don't make that mistake. I ha it has happened. It, it, it happened. It happened to, to uh, several, I couldn't say many, because the, the very great, the very vast majority of the priests of the Society of St. Pius X are good and holy men. But uh, of course they're not all perfect. Some of them uh, will not be uh, your style, let's say. Some of them you might not like as much as you, unfortunately, like me. But uh, <laughs> some of them uh, might not be what you expect. But uh, let this be of no concern to you. You are not going there to see a priest. You are going there to have mass. If you like the priest, then uh, enjoy him. If you don't like him, pray for him. But go to the mass. Because only at the chapel of St. Pa not Not because it's valid, but because it's licit. Of course it's valid, otherwise it wouldn't be licit. But validity is not sufficient. A mass has to be valid and licit. That means it has to be in the law of God. It has to be a pleasing act to God. It has to be what God wants. And uh, listen to his sermons. Listen to his sermons because uh, uh, only at the chapel of St. Pius X you can be sure that the sermon was correct. It might be an utterly boring sermon, I don't know. It might be a thrilling sermon, but only at the chapel of St. Pius X you will be sure the sermon is correct. And with the fraternity of St. Peter you get a lot of, you know what, sometimes. And uh, uh, with the other groups. With the Society of St. Pius X you can rest assured that the sermons are correct and, and in order. They might sometimes be not of very great interest to you, but uh, they will always be correct. You cannot be misled by them. That's the point. Now, how are they, their priests formed that lead you to say that? Their priests are formed in a way that bishops in the 1930s would be happy to have had. Seminaries in the 1930s were not nearly at the intellectual and spiritual level of the seminary of Winona under the leadership of Bishop Williamson. Uh, excuse me, Rich, uh, Williamson, yes. Richard Williamson. Huh? Winona, Minnesota. That's the seminary for the Society of St. Pius X in, in, in America. In, in North America, I should say. 
South America, you have the one La Reja in, 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 uh, in Argentine. And uh, uh, they have seminaries that are very strict, like military academies, and on a level that most bishops dreamed of 70 years ago. Huh? The only reason why I never joined the Society of St. Pius, one of, the, one of the few reasons why I never joined the Society of St. Pius X is because I do not get wine on weekdays, and I do not accept that, period. <laughs> but there is nothing wrong with them as far as important things are concerned, I believe me. No, I would give that up readily. Well, no. I know they're not allowed no. to watch television. Wine is 10,000 times more important than uh, uh, movies. <laughs> Okay, any other question left? Why, a what? Why the Among many other things, but Gilbert Keith Chesterton, as usual, was right when he said there's only one legitimate motive to drink wine, and this is because you like it. <laughs> no, I just said because you like it. <laughs> uh, didn't I express my opinion very clearly? <laughs> Where do we go? Who do you think is going to succeed? Madam, I ain't no prophet. <laughs> I know that the chance of a Catholic Pope succeeding is minimal. Who's your money on? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, humanly speaking, no. I ain't no prophet. Uh, no. <laughs> I sure ain't no prophet. <laughs> a good way that possibly could be. Forget it. Forget it. Don't forget I can't look into the hearts of men. There might be a hidden good man turn out to be turn out differently than expected. Huh? He may boomerang on them. Yeah. And that's our only chance. Yeah, that's right, he might be. Welcome to our talk tonight, and first of all, I want to thank Arlene and the Holly family for having us, for hosting this event, and we're going to stop hopefully at 8.30 so that we can vacate for nine so Arlene can go on a trip tomorrow. And now I want to introduce Father Gregor Hess. Father has went to Rome, and he uh, was in Rome for many years, and he has a sacred licentiate in theology and a doctorate in theology and a and a licentiate and doctorate in canon law, and he worked for Cardinal Stickler for several years, and now Father has returned to Vienna, and we are fortunate to have him here while he's visiting the United States. Father Gregor Hess on the conditions of the church. Thank you. All right. It's like at a press conference here. Okay. Start with a short prayer. In nomine Patris et Filii Spiritus Sancti Amen. Actionis nostra quesumus Domini aspirando previne, et adivando pro seque, et contra nostra oratio et operatio, et esem principes, per te cepta finiato, per Christum Dominum nostrum. Sancti Pie Decime, ora pro nobis. Now, the, uh, the whole mess Father Hess is going to talk about started, uh, well, it it goes back to the original sin, of course, but it started in an intensive way 
at the end of last century, when Pope Leo the Thirteenth, who uh, was a very good pope and a very intelligent pope and a very erudite pope uh, and a very gifted pope, but not exactly the best. Uh, um, how shall I say? He didn't know people. He was not a good judge of men. And uh, he chose as his secretary of state a certain cardinal called Mariano Rampolla del Tindoro, who unfortunately was not only member of a Masonic lodge, but had founded his own Masonic lodge. So that's when everything started. Cardinal Mariano Rampolla del Tindoro is the one who is responsible for the otherwise strange fact that it needed until 1899 before... Uh, what is sometimes called the Americanist heresy was condemned, which consists basically in the same types of errors and ecumenism that was officially pronounced in Vatican II. Mariano Rampolla del Tindoro, unfortunately, had spiritual children. Spiritual, I don't know if he had natural children, I'm not interested, but he had spiritual children, and uh, when St. Pius X died, one uh, his own protege, his own spiritual son became Pope, and that's Benedict XV, but we'll come back to that. In 1903, when Leo XIII died, Mariano Rampolla del Tindoro almost became Pope. And here's the reason, people like footnotes and sources, here's the reason why I know that Mariano Rampolla del Tindoro was in, fa in fact a Mason, and, not just, uh, and this is not just a rumor, because the Empress of Austria, the last Empress of Austria, Zita, was a very good friend of my uncle, Monsignor Hesse, in Vienna, and she told him personally, before she died, that Francis Joseph, the uh, before last emperor of Austria, who reigned between 1848 until 1916, and 1916, knew that Mariano Rampolo was a mason. And so he pronounced the uh, century-old veto against Mariano Rampolo del Tindoro by the time he had had two-thirds of the votes. And this is how St. Pius X got elected. This is something that I cannot scientifically prove. You will just have to believe me. My uncle told me that the Empress Sita had told him that. As far as I know, my uncle never lied to me, and as far as I know, the Empress Sita was a very honest person. And this is, of course, family tradition in the Habsburgs. This is not something that would be given to the newspapers, but uh, the Empress, of course, having been the wife of the, the grand-nephew of the old Emperor Francis Joseph, knew about these things. And uh, so in 1903, uh, almost, we almost had a, Mas a Masonic Pope. In 1914, we got a Pope who was not exact, could not exactly be called a Masonic Pope, but he was not uh, all too unfriendly towards them. Fortunately, uh, there's good things coming out of everything. The First World War kept the Pope busy enough to stay out of church politics. And uh, in 1922, Pius XI got elected. Now, whatever I say here, I do not believe that Pius XI was in any way bad personally. But uh, again, uh, naive and too trusting, he uh, appointed a certain Cardinal Gaspari, who had been the Secretary of State under Benedict XV, to be his Secretary of State. And Cardinal Gaspari it was a sort of spiritual grandchild to Mariano Rampolla del Tindoro. So we get the same tradition going. And there's something much worse about it. Pius XII, who for many so-called conservatives and so-called traditionalists, is the most holy of all popes ever, something like this, and the last beautiful, glorious Catholic Pope, in fact, was not exactly what some people believe he was. Eugenio Pacelli was not only never in a seminary, except for two years. He had homeschooling, but not the way it is now. This was the other way around in the last century. Pacelli went to high school after the so-called Risorgimento, the separation of church and state in Italy, he went to a, a high school that was is called the uh, the uh, uh, help me father the Liceo Liceo. You still got it in Rome, and it was the most secular and anti-clerical of all high schools in Rome. Liceo Visconti. 
and in the Liceo Visconti, Pacelli was raised. After that, he was taught privately by university professors, and just for the sake of canon law, he went to a seminary for two years. Guess what seminary? He spent the two years of his seminar uh, as a seminarian of uh, in 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 the uh, in the uh, Collegio Capranica of all places. Now the Capranica in Rome was and still is the center of modernism. All the famous modernists that were condemned by Pius X lived on the Capranica or worked for the Capranica or had some connections to the Capranica. Now, I'm not saying that Pius XII was a modernist. In, no, in not a single one of his documents, you will find something wrong. I mean, you can, you can always interpret things in, 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 uh, in, in a negative way and find faults even with uh, the greatest uh, church father's writings. But uh, not, not a single piece of uh, Pius XII's writings could be called anything but Catholic. The problem with Pius XII is what he did. And here is what he did. I do not have to tell the people present, not yet, not, a, not today, uh, that you cannot touch liturgy. Father Prince Chard in his book makes that evidently clear, and he's absolutely right about it. No pope and no other person, therefore, has the right to touch liturgy, to change liturgy, or to create anything new in the liturgy. Pius XII did. In 1949, he discovered a certain uh, teacher at the Lateran University in Rome called Annibale Bonini. Does that ring a bell, that name? It was Pius XII who discovered Bonini. It was Pius XII who funded Bonini. It, is it was Pius XII who gave Bonini the power to change things. Before I forget to say that, John XXIII, the moment he was pope, threw a Bonini out. Needless to say, Paul VI had him back immediately. But uh, uh, Pius XII asked Bonini to reform Holy Week. Now, there's two parts of the, mis of the Roman Missal. The Ordo Missa, the unchangeable part, and the Propers. Now, the most important part of the Propers is Holy Week, needless to say. And he wanted Holy Week to be changed. I have to remind you of the fact that uh, the, the ceremony on Good Friday, the, the Mass of the pre-sanctified, is the oldest part of the entire Latin Roman liturgy. The Mass of the pre-sanctified most probably goes back to the times of the Apostles. I mean, as is. Until Pius XII. Uh, there is no time tonight, unfortunately, to explain the changes, I would like to give a three-hour conference on that, and it would be worth it, but uh, you just look it up. You try to find a missile that uh, was printed before 1949 and one that was printed after 1955, and you compare the changes, and you will be surprised. There's one change only that I'm going to put out, to point out. In the old liturgical rules, there's a reason why you will never see a black curtain on the tabernacle. Even in a requiem mass, the curtain on the tabernacle has to be violated as reverence to the Blessed Sacrament. Now, with that, ex with that in mind, as an excuse, Bonini, in 1950, in 1949, changed the Good Friday liturgy around, and instead of wearing a black chasuble all through Mass except the Adoration of the Cross, the priest now wears a black cope until the communion rite, and then he wears a violet chasuble at the communion rite. Now, the excuse for this change which was unheard of in the Catholic Church, the excuse for this change was reverence to the Blessed Sacrament. But at the same time, they abolished the incense. In the old days, before 1949, the Blessed Sacrament, first of all, no communion to the people, and I refuse it on Good Friday, uh, the, the Blessed Sacrament was kept, was kept on a side altar that was beautifully decorated, and then uh, after the adoration of the cross and the improperia, the priest would, in a solemn procession, pick up the Blessed Sacrament, carry it over to the altar, and all the way it would be incensed. It would be incensed at the special side altar. It would be incensed with the uh, thoroughfare walking backwards, and two of them, as a matter of fact, on the way to the altar, and then it would be incensed on the altar, and uh, after elevating the pattern with the host, which is not to indicate consecration, but just to show our Lord to the people, the priest would not just genuflect, 
but make uh, a reverence down to earth. Which is exactly how the consecration was done in the early days. Before they had to, uh, they had to stop insisting on it because old priests and old bishops were not able to perform that anymore. And uh, this is one of the most fundamental changes in reality because it's the first time that any pope ever dared to attack or to touch the oldest part of the entire liturgy. Now in the Eastern churches you still have pre-sanctified masses on the ember days. But in the Catholic Church, the mass of the pre-sanctified Good Friday is the last one left. Was the last one left, because now, of course, forget it. Um, so this is just to show you what Pius XII did. Don't ever think that Pius XII was the last conservative pope. He was anything but conservative. He was Catholic. He had the faith. He proved this in writing. He gave it to us in writing, so to say. But in his actions, he was the first pope of the new church. And don't forget... König, Alfring, Stöpfner, Swinnens, Leonard, and all these people were appointments by Pius XII. He chose them. And don't tell me, yes, but he didn't make them cardinals. That's not true. He didn't make them cardinals because he didn't want to make them cardinals, but because after 1953 he did not appoint a single cardinal anymore. And uh, don't tell me that he wanted to get rid of Montini by making him Archbishop of Milan. Please don't. Because Pius XII was not an imbecile. Pius XII knew that the, Arch, uh, the Archdiocese of Milan had given to the Church the Pope who made him Secretary of State, Pius XI. Pius XI was Archbishop of Milan. So if you want to get rid of a Monsignor, you do not make him Papabile, right? And the only reason why Montini was not a Cardinal in 1958 is because nobody got appointed anymore after 1953. So we have to, we have to notice, sadly, that the influence... Now, parenthesis, I am firmly convinced that Pius XII did not realize what he was doing. But this is not the point of the conference here. We are not sitting in judgment over poor Eugenio Pacelli. We are discussing historical facts and nothing else. And as a historical fact, Pius XII was not a conservative pope. He was not a traditional pope. He was just barely Catholic in his writings. What he did to liturgy is far underestimated. In 1958, when uh, Pius XII died, the only part of the Roman liturgy that was intact and well-preserved all over the world was the canon. Nothing else. In 1949, Pius XII gave permission to the Chinese to say Mass in the vernacular, except for the canon. In 1958, just a, a few months before he died, just about in time, he gave permission to the German bishops and the Austrian bishops and the German-speaking bishops in Switzerland to say the reading and the gospel in German right up there on the altar. That means for the first time, you were give, you, uh, the priest dressed as a priest with his maniple and chasuble on was speaking the vernacular, and not only the vernacular, but on the altar of Christ he was reading a lousy translation instead of the Word of God. So this is what Pius XII did, and many other little details for which we do not have time. So by the time uh, 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 Pius XII died, the Church was indeed ready for the revolution. Absolutely and totally ready for it. The reason why our dear friend Archbishop Lefebvre uh, always pointed out 1958, 1958, 1958, is simple. People get confused when you tell them the whole story. So it is easier uh, to point out 1958 for pastoral reasons, uh, because if uh, in, uh, you know how it is, as a priest, you ask many questions. And, most, and many people come up and say, Father, can I trust this book? And I will look it up and say it was printed before 1958. You probably can trust it. So it's just uh, it's a way of simplifying things for uh, necessities. And uh, this is what Archbishop Lefebvre had in mind when he said 1958 and 1958 was a change. But in, in, in many of his sermons, he explained very well that indeed this was not a, a radical change, but something that grew like a cancer. So in 1958, the church was already in a mess. The only thing is you couldn't see it. Very few people saw it. But Pius XII left, left a shipwreck, 
and Paul VI sunk it. And, uh, well, there's very little to say about John XXIII. He, we know he was a communist because uh, uh, in 1958, in 1955, uh, uh, I think it was, or 54, when he became uh, Patriarch of Venice, he helped the communist unions in Venice. This was at a time when Pius XII had put the membership of the Communist Party under excommunication. And this was the time the two most important, the, the three most important factors of destruction in the church grew. That was during the 19 infelicitous years of Pius XII. The three most important were the new popes, the new liturgy, and the Opus Dei. The Opus Dei, which is the heart and the brain of the conciliar church in reality. The so-called, and that will have to be taken back, in the future. The so-called blessed Jose Marie Escri Escriva de Balaguer uh, admitted members of the Communist Party, and mind you, I read this in books published by the Opus Dei or endorsed by the Opus Dei. I do not make the mistake of quoting other people against the Opus Dei. Pius XII admitted uh, excuse me, uh, Jose Marie Escriva de Balaguer, the founder and the first prelate of the Opus Dei admitted members of the Communist Party into the Opus Dei without, without asking them to leave the Communist Party in a time when membership in the Communist Party was under excommunication. So far about Blessed José María Escriá de Balaguer. And uh, John XXIII did exactly the same in Venice when he was Patriarch, Archbishop of Venice. Of Venice. And... Uh, I guess uh, as far as historical things are concerned, that's where we can stop because everybody present and everybody who will see this tape will know what to think about Paul VI, I, I hope. I should say something about the past of Paul VI. In the 1930s, uh, a certain book called L'Humanisme Integral, Integral Humanism, by a certain Jacques Maritain, which is a book that postulates the impossible and the blasphemous because it postulates uh, the Reconciliation of Humanism and Christendom. This book was translated by a certain Giovanni Battista Montini into Italian and got an absolutely uh, spectacular preface. The translator loved the book. And that was a spectacular happening in those days, in a time when Pius XI ex had, had people thrown out for things like this. I don't know why Montini survived Pius XI, but I guess it was because a certain Gaspari, whom I mentioned before, was the Secretary of State. Giovanni Battista Montini was certainly the person who found and discovered Bunini under Pius XII. However, this does not change what I said before, because Pius XII celebrated those changes himself. He, he approved of them, he agreed with them, he had them published, he had them man made, he made them mandatory, mandatory, and he changed them, and he used them. And the same Pius XII uh, uh, had, I'm sure this was Cardinal Bea, who discovered the, uh, the Jesuits who would translate the Psalms of the Breviary. That means the 150 Psalms of David, which would have meant the end of Gregorian chant. You cannot use those Psalms for singing. Believe me, I know what I'm talking about. And uh, so 1958, the church was a wreck. The uh, Vatican Council, which should be subject of another talk of mine, because uh, that's not something I, I can deal with in 10 minutes. Vatican Council established something that a certain Bishop Carroll of Carrollton in 1789 in this country had already uh, wished for the American church. That means ecumenism, liberalism, and uh, uh, lack, uh, a lack in, in liturgical discipline, and vernacular liturgy, and all that garbage. Uh, Paul VI instituted it. The Vatican II postulated it. Don't say, don't say the Sacrosanctum Concilium did not want a new liturgy. I will prove to you that it did. Paul VI established a new church which I call the counterfeit church, because it calls itself Catholic, 
it claims to be founded by Jesus Christ. It was not founded by Jesus Christ. It was founded by Paul VI and his predecessors and Vatican II. And uh, the, the present situation is even worse than what Father Trinchard says in his book. The present situation is even worse. Not only you will find, as Father Trinchard points out very well, in this country you will hardly find a priest left who believes in the real presence. You will hardly find a priest left who believes in the transubstantiation. On the contrary, you will find that only a priest who denies the real presence, at least privately, will become bishop. You will find that despite all of his nice little talks, this pope hates the old mass. In, 18, in, in 1988, in a, uh, in a decree that I can only call double fraud, theological and canonical fraud, uh, the present pope claimed that he wished the bishops to be more tolerant with the old mass. A year later, in a speech, he said, Valde dolendum est. It is very hurtful to me that there are still some people left who cling to these forms of worship. So for the present Pope, these are just the traditional Latin Mass, the only Mass of the Latin Rite. The uh, in eternum, forever, canonized Mass is just another form of worship. And uh, this is so bad that today... It is impossible to uh, be promoted in church government in Rome without saying the new mass, without uh, defending Vatican II, and without denying dogma. That means it is a fully and completely, completely heretical church, and Bishop Tissier de Malare of the Society of St. Pius X very, very rightly said it is, agnost it is a Gnostic sect. Gnosticism is something which we know to be uh, in deep down a satanic rite and a satanic belief and a satanic religion. And the, the counterfeit church, the conciliar church, is a Gnostic sect. And uh, this goes to the point that uh, I do not refer to the uh, very untrustworthy book of Malachi Martin, Windswept House. I refer to... Uh, uh, information from inside the Vatican. I don't know about any uh, satanic consecration ever done in a chapel in the Vatican. I know that there are active Satanists in the Vatican. I know that one of the secretaries, one of the secretaries of the present Pope, was threatened with his life, uh, finding uh, uh, graffiti in his own apartment, which is a very secure apartment inside the Vatican. He found satanic graffiti, painted with blood. And uh, they tried to murder another secretary of the Pope because uh, this present Pope is not good enough for them, believe it or not. When you, if you, when you want to realize in what a state the Church is, then first you have to see in what a state this Pope is. I believe that this present Pope has never had the Catholic faith. His documents prove that to me. Because in his documents, I quote, Catechesi Tradenda number 32, he is quoting, he is quoting uh, Dinitatis Humane, number three. The Pope speaks plain heresy. I do not say that makes him cease to be Pope. I do not say that. It's material heresy. He just writes it. He doesn't say, I want to say something different from the Council of Trent. He does not say, the Council of Trent said, but I say. He just uh, says, I'm perfectly within tradition when I say that a Protestant can be saved through the efforts of the Protestant churches. So that's material heresy. Material heresy doesn't necessarily make him to seize Pope, and a future Pope will have to decide that question anyway, so we cannot endorse and help the city of Acantis. But when you realize in what a situation we find the church with this Pope, and when I tell you that this Pope is by far not good enough for them, not heretical enough, not modernist enough, then you know what the church looks like. And I'm talking about the, not just an, a minority clique in the Vatican, but I'm talking about the majority of the bishops. I'm talking about the majority of the clergy, to whom this pope is the symbol of conservatism.
They just had, uh, they just collected signatures uh, a half a year ago, a year ago. They collected signatures in Austria against this pope because he's too conservative. He's not open enough, not accommodating enough, not ecumenical enough. And here you talk about a pope who worships uh, nature with, uh, uh, with animists in uh, a sanctuary at Lake Togo in Cameroon in 1986. In this, uh, in this regard, I recommend Daniel LaRue's book, uh, uh, Peter, Does Thou Love Me? And uh, the worst thing is, I do not see, humanly speaking, I'm not a prophet, I cannot, uh, I cannot argue with uh, God's providence, and I cannot argue with miracles, but humanly speaking, I do not see the slightest chance of uh, a next pope being elected who would be better. I got to know many cardinals in Rome. The few ones who are better than this pope do not stand the slightest chance, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, you wanted to hear what the situation in the church is. This is what it is. This pope is not good enough for them. Even though he speaks about a second Pentecost, he speaks about the church of the new advent, and in his encyclicals he hardly ever, if ever, mentions the Roman Catholic Church or the Catholic Church. In his first encyclical, Redemptor Hominis, which is usually called the so-called, which is usually the program encyclical of a pope, he does not mention the word Roman Catholic or Catholic Church even once. Not once. But he speaks about the conscience of the Church. You uh, living in this country, you just have to switch on TV and you will, the, 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 this will sound familiar, conscience of the Church. It's all psychology, psychology, not theology. And he speaks about the Church of the New Advent, which for this Pope who tw uh, three times in a row already claimed that he's not a millenarian, however, uh, this the year 2000 seems to be the most important thing for him. And, uh, which is ridiculous. It shows that he's a superstitious pagan deep in heart. Yeah. He's an ignorant of theology. He's an ignorant of canon law. He proved that in Ecclesia Dei. And uh, he seems to be a superstitious pagan because he talks all the time about the year 2000, about the new Pentecost, which is in dogmatically impossible. And he, all he talks about the Church of the New Advent. What new Advent? And this Pope is not good enough for them. Curia eleison. So, questions? Where are we going? <laughs> I ain't going to talk because I'm 82 years old. Well, I can only give a, a 30 second sermon on that. Everybody present concerned, starting with me, we shouldn't worry about the last judgment. We have to worry about the personal judgment the moment we die. Make sure you stay in the life of grace and don't worry about when the last judgment is going to come. I don't like Catholic form of rainbow press or weekly uh, world news or national enquirer. Yeah, no prophecies. Go ahead. We heard um, recently about Rome being upset with the Society of Pius X. <laughs> Naturally. And they're planning a main punishment. Do you have any insight what that might be? No, but it makes me laugh. It's good entertainment. Will they excommunicate us a second time? Uh, I, I'm, I'm quite sure we will be terribly afraid of that. Yeah, right. No, I have to say for the video, I'm not a member of the Society of St. Pius X, but I work for them and I'm proud of it. Yes? Could you enlarge on the role a little bit of Opus Dei that you mentioned? Yes. Now, uh, the Opus Dei is the intellectual nucleus of the, of the conciliar church. It's the brain of the conciliar church. Because uh, the Opus Dei will openly admit that it was José María Escrivá de Balaguer who uh, had the idea of Gaudium et Spes, the idea of uh, a church based on the lay people, a church growing from beneath. Which is, uh, 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 the church, uh, you have to understand, the church is essentially ecclesiastical, priestly, hierarchical. The church comes from Christ through the Pope, the cardinals, the bishops, and the priests unto the faithful. It does not grow among the faithful. José María Escrivá de Balaguer, all of his life, preached that the church grows on the basis of the faithful, on the laity. And in this regard, I recommend to everybody present, 
that uh, you must read, I demand, if you want to inform yourself, and that's the reason why you're here or watching the tape, you must read the encyclical of Pius X against modernism, Pascendi, Dominici Gregis. You must read it. And you must not just flip through it like uh, a Clive Kessler novel. You have to study it. And you will find, you will find uh, the, the paragraph where St. Pius X says, we are facing a grave danger with, the, uh, with that concept of the laity, the church being based on the laity. So the idea of a church that was based on the laity was condemned by Pius X. But José Marie Escrivá de Balaguer preached it, and who approved his institution? Pius XII, again. And now his institution is the most powerful within the Catholic Church. They are the ones who serve the purpose of appeasing the conservatives by telling them, oh, oh you have to keep the Sixth Commandment and the others too. And uh, they are the ones who will present, who will have their priests uh, in clergymen, cassock, neatly dressed, celebrating the Novus Ordo in vernacular, in a decent and nice way. And they are the ones who will tell you that Vatican II can be interpreted in a Catholic sense. It's the Opus Dei, the brain behind that childish and absurd idea that Vatican II could have a Catholic interpretation. There is no way to interpret Vatican II in a Catholic way. I mean, I'm not talking about every single line, obviously. 90% of Vatican II are just uh, 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 warmed up doctrine. And, and uh, the description of papal infallibility in Vatican II is very beautiful, which doesn't help the fact that a few paragraphs later, the infallibility is kind of, you know, uh, put under the table. Swept under the table. I don't talk about what I don't know enough about. I read in Father Franz Schmidberger's uh, pamphlet art, where he talked about, um, you know, what led up to the Episcopal consecrations of 1988, and in a strange way, he sort of didn't aside and he compared the um, the writings of Pope Pius X from his encyclical on mixed marriages and compared the exact same encyclical that Pope John Paul II wrote on mixed marriages where Pope Pius X says in no uncertain terms why it's wrong for say a Catholic to marry a Protestant or a Catholic to marry yes. any other than I Catholic and then in Pope John Paul II's encyclical he basically says it in, no, in black and white he says that he encourages Catholics to marry non-Catholics if for no other reason than to promote communion. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Schmidtberger is right. But that's not the explanation for, that's not the, just, not the justification of the Episcopal consecrations of 1998, no, 1988. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, he's right. Uh, he's right with that. I've never read anything wrong written by, Franz, by, by Father Franz Schmidtberger. No, I've never. I read. I read practically everything he wrote, and everything was uh, excellent uh, theology and 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 uh, down to the point. The the Episcopal consecrations of 1988 are very very easily justified. The last canon of the new code of canon law says that the uh, the most important law uh, of the church is to save souls. So uh, with the new rite, which is against divine law, you cannot save souls. You cannot save souls with young people who want to become priests and have to accept a heretical council and uh, 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 an ordo missa that is at least leading towards her, at least leading towards heresy. Uh, you cannot have Catholic priests that way. And there's no official seminary in the, in the so-called Catholic Church that would ordain a young man who does not accept Vatican II and who does not accept the new rite. So for the, in order for the church to survive, we need bishops. Bishops to consecrate and create priests. And this is why those four bishops were consecrated by Archbishop Lefebvre. This was an act of self-defense of the church, perfectly justified by the law of necessity. And as a matter of fact, the moment, see, self-defense takes place, has to take place the moment you see. If you see a girl raped on the other sidewalk of the street, you can't say, I'm going to help you in an hour from now. 
You have to act right now and right here. And the moment Archbishop Lefebvre realized and had proof for the fact that Rome was going to trick him into submission, he acted. And he consecrated the bishops. Not because he wanted to, not because he enjoyed it, but because he had to. He was the only one who, except Castro, Bishop Castro Maya, they were the only two ones who understood the situation. They had to act. Thank, thank God, thank yes. Okay, now how does that relate to Archbishop Tuch on uh, Stockard, THUC? You know, I do not know enough about the case to talk about it. We, we met some priests in Los Angeles, a uh, priest, yeah. a brother and him and his other brother, and they both uh, became priests. And they're traditional priests and everything about them. Yeah, I do not know enough about it to talk about it. Except they can't study the contest stand. And, Which is uh, bad enough. Right. Uh, according to Father Trinshaw, they've softened their stand there, but they wrote an excellent book of documentation and almost everything that you said about John the Twenty Third and Vatican II yeah. and politics was in that book. And it was yeah, yeah. Well, I got some of my uh, 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 one of my uh, most important sources of information was a book printed in this country uh, by some crazy set of accountants. Uh, you just have to seed through the information. Right. Just take what what uh, what is worthwhile and what is not, because these people usually are not theologians and they are not able to do theological distinctions. And before we end this today, I'm going to give you three theological distinctions, which I will repeat in every single conference, because you can't hear it often enough. I want you to be able to distinguish between six terms: act and potency, mm -hmm. act and potency. Objective and subjective, formal and material. You don't understand these distinctions, you better don't talk theology. Because uh, the greatest problem today is most priests are completely incapable of uh, distinguishing uh, objective, subjective, and formal and material. And I will give you the explanation. Act and potency is easy to understand. Anything that is in reality is an act. Anything that could be in reality is in potency. So... I am a priest in act. I am a father in act, spiritually. I'm a, I'm a father physically in potency. Hope never in act. I am a bishop in potency. I am a pope in potency. And I am a saint in potency. But I am not a mother in potency. Potency means there is a potential. It could be. It can be. Act means it actually is. And the reason why you need this distinction is not for itself. Anybody can see that. Scholastic philosophy is common sense and nothing else. The reason why this distinction is very important is because you understand the heresies of today much better when you understand it. What would you say if I stood up now and said, I am Pope? You'd call the, you'd call the ambulance, right? I hope so. Or you'd kick me out, or you'd give me another drink to make sure I become God, or something like this. But... And yet I spoke the truth. I am, I am the Pope. Yes, in potency. And see, this is what they do in Vatican II. They tell you something in potency, but they do not say it is in potency. This Pope says, all men will be saved. Potentially, yeah, sure, sure, sure. In act, definitely not. Christ has died for all people in potency, but not in act. It won't take place. Those who reject him, he did not die for in the end. In potentia and in actu, that you have to understand. And when you speak normal language, and believe me, according to the laws of canon law, and according to the laws of theology, and according to church tradition, when you pronounce something in church teaching, you have to use everyday common, correct language, and not some fantastic newspeak, or politically correct garbage. So when you say, this and this is so and so, you presume the reader will say in act, not in potency. So you're not allowed to say that uh, uh, this is my child is given for all. It's only in potency given for all, not in act. But you do not say in potency or act here. You do not say it. So you presume one of the two. And in, every, in everyday language, you presume in act. This is why you would presume that I am crazy when I, if I told you I am Pope. And yet it's true, I am the Pope. Not much probability to it, but uh, w when I think who, got, who became Pope in 1978, I give myself a chance. Huh? So, uh, in potency I am Pope, in potency he is Pope in potency. Huh? 
But if I was going to say, uh, Father Trinchard is Pope, you would say, oh yeah, sure, another one who cracked up. Remember we took an oath, uh, there's always a strange clause in it, oath against uh, modernism. Yes. But there's always a strange clause that uh, it stuck in my mind that we accept things the way they're written. Yes. And exactly. And Vatican II had a part like that. Yes. You ex accept it the way yeah. it is according to Constitution. Exactly. Like and that is, is uh, yeah, that is the rule of the interpretation of canon law codified again in the 1983 Code of Canon Law this Pope signed. Huh? So this Pope is bound to it. And when he says, when he says uh, that all people uh, are saved by Christ, he cannot presume that we will understand impotency. And I don't care what he thinks, he said that they are all saved in act. Well, actually, he doesn't formulate it that directly. Huh? This Pope is too intelligent and too literary a man to uh, pronounce a heresy of this kind uh, too clearly. Mm -hmm. So I did not quote the Pope now. But I quoted the Pope when I said that the Protestants are saved through the efforts of, the, of their churches. For those who like quotations, mm -hmm. yes, that's heresy against uh, the Council of Florence, Pope Eugene the Fourth, Denzinger Schönmetzer Collection, 1325. And uh, in Catechesi uh, Tradendi number 32, the Pope says, Quarum ope Spiritus Christi non abnuit salutem affere. For the efforts of whom, and he, the, the, the line before says, Ecclesia Protestantice, the Protestant churches, for the efforts of whom the Spirit of Christ does not die to give, uh, deny, does not deny to give salvation. That's explicit written heresy, and I don't give a damn about what the Pope thinks. This is what he wrote. This is material heresy. Think of the Senate can't this be right? No, because it's material heresy. Next distinction. Objective, subjective. We'll talk about salvation. So material heresy... Wait a second. Third distinction. We have the second distinction. Objective, subjective. When I said to us, a judge of the Supreme Court in Vienna, and I get this is a really... Uh, this is really something else. Uh, a, a judge of the Supreme Court in Vienna who doesn't understand the distinction of objective subjective, so you don't have to be ashamed. Uh, he said, when I when I quoted Pope Eugene the Fourth, he said, "Are you trying to tell me that all and every single Protestant will go to hell?" And I said, uh, "Your Honor, if you are not able to distinguish subjective and objective, then you should not talk." He was deeply offended, got up and left, and so I had all the peace and the time to explain to those who were left, who had, who, who, were, who stayed, that uh, the church is not able to said. We do not have the slightest idea what happens to a Protestant when he kicks the bucket. We don't know. But objectively speaking, he has no chance to be saved. Pope Eugene IV said, whoever is not in union with the Roman pontiff, may he even think of shedding his blood for Christ, he cannot be saved. So when this Pope speaks about Protestant martyrs in Czechoslovakia, he speaks heresy and blasphemy too. Objective, subjective, and not material and formal. Material and formal should really be easily understood. Material means the matter, the material. Formal means the meaning. So let's say I make a mistake in a sermon, and making a mistake in a sermon, I pronounce something wrong. Uh, objectively, it's material heresy. Subjectively, it is not. Uh, you've got two distinctions at once here. Subjectively, it's not because I didn't realize it even. I mean, I didn't even notice what, uh, that I, I left out a word or, or said yes or, uh, instead of no. So subjectively, I do not commit the sin of heresy. Objectively, it's a heresy because I'm saying something against the doctrine of the church. But this is still material heresy because I do not say that I want to say something against the doctrine of the church. Formal heresy is when you want to say something against the doctrine of the church and when you say so. So it becomes formal. The only way to, be, to, to speak formal heresy is to tell everybody present the Council of Trent taught that Christ is really present on the altar but I say he is not. Now that's formal heresy. But if some idiot or warped mind, like John Paul II, say he is a warped mind, then I can prove it. Uh, when, he, uh, if, when he says, 
uh, a Protestant can be saved through the efforts of the of, of the of the of the Protestant churches, and at the same time he claims to be in perfect union with the tradition of the church, then I would say he's ignorant and maybe a crackpot and definitely a formal uh, a material heretic. But this is not formal heresy. If he said, I don't care what Pope Eugen the Fourth said, but I tell you that a Protestant can be saved. Okay, we got him down. In that case, he's most probably would cease to be Pope. I say, right? But uh, this is not the case. So you have to remember those three distinctions. That's the last thing I'm going to say tonight. Material, formal, objective, subjective, and act and potency. Maybe you have to bring in the juridical. In other words, with the state of the contest, who's going to make a decision the external form? And then that's obvious. That's, that's, that's right, yeah. If this pope said, uh, I don't care what uh, Pope Eugene IV said or the Council of Trent, I say something else then who will judge where the formal heresy starts? Mm -hmm. and who will who, judge the Pope? Who will and judge the Pope, no, yeah. No one in Rome. No, Canon 333, paragraph 3, Prima Sedis Animini Judicato, the Holy See cannot be judged by anyone. Huh? So, so we'd just be, we no, we'd, we'd be hanging in mid-air with a question mark. That's all. Pope. Well, then, Til, yeah. Pope John Paul II must have a very clear understanding of me uh, material and formal. Because no, I don't think so, because first of all, his philosophy is extremely lousy. His, uh, his uh, theological upbringing is, un under, uh, the, uh, is beneath the regular standard. Well, and his knowledge. understanding of canon law, his ignorance of canon law is proven in Ecclesia Dei, where he speaks about schism with the Society of St. Pius X, while Ratzinger says they are not in schism, and a recent thesis that had been approved by the Gregorian Papal University in Rome says they are not in schism. The Pope... Uh, in Ecclesia Dei says they are in schism three times over. He says it. Mm -hmm. uh, so and he doesn't obviously doesn't understand the meaning of the of, of the canons that he signed. Well, my point of it is though he comes so close to formal heresy but never quite nailed well, himself. No, form. there actually to be quite honest, uh, there is no such thing as coming close to formal heresy. Well, mm -hmm. he, he, he there is no such material heresy. Then I mean, what, yeah, he is he, he's the most he's he's the most heretical pope in history. Yeah, definitely. But uh, formal heresy means uh, something uh, uh, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty clear. And as this pope is never, this pope is never clear. I guess I'm trying to decide if he. The only thing is clear about is is his enjoyment of pagan religions. Does he know he's he's misdirecting the church? Does he do it consciously, or is he just judge not that you not be judged? You can't judge. The internis ecclesia non judicat. I do not know what the pope thinks. I do not know what the pope wants. And even if I would know it, I'm not his judge. I cannot judge the person. I do not talk and refuse absolutely to talk about the person of Karol Wojtyla, his conscience and his soul. We can just take his actions. Absolutely. I judge his acts. I judge his act, a way of government. And I judge his pronouncements. Nothing else. I do not have the right to, do, to judge anything else. And I, would not have, I do not have the right to speak against anything this Pope said or, or wrote or pronounced unless I can prove what I say. I cannot criticize the Pope for having said that the, the I, I cannot uh, criticize the Pope for Catechesi Tradenda number 32 unless I quote Eugene IV. I have to quote a predecessor. I cannot quote a theologian against the Pope. The theologians I have do not have the Holy Spirit promised to them. On the contrary, they usually don't have a spark of Holy Spirit in them. Huh? So this is the point. I, I'm not allowed to contradict the Pope unless I can prove to the contrary with a prede predecessor of his, because the Pope, uh, by church tradition, by the oath of incarnation, is bound to follow his predecessors, and he's bound to do so by the fourth chapter of the Dogma on Infallibility, Denzinger Schönmetzer 3004. Why is, it, why is it like, even on sex education, you see that he speaks out against it in Rome, but yet his cardinals let it happen? Because uh, something that does not have the Holy Spirit, do you expect it to be orderly? Mm. Mm. Well, he, he, he must know what's going on. Huh? Oh, he, uh, he knows. You uh, gave us a good background of uh, Pope Pius XII. Could you give us some of uh, John Paul II's um, education? Back? Well, I, I can name a few facts because a lot of it, uh, a lot of it is speculation. John Paul II uh, uh, did not have a proper theological education because, uh, understandably so, because it was war. And he had to hide. 
And then, of course, he went to the Angelicum in Rome. Now, I have six academic degrees from the Angelicum in Rome. I can tell you they are not worth anything. And this Pope has his doctorate in theology from the Angelicum in Rome, Bonanotte. I did those degrees because stupid, superficial people in this world want degrees. They want to see degrees. But rest assured, the theology that I learned through uh, the, 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 patience and, uh, the patience of other priests and the mercy of God, I did not learn. I learned perhaps in one-third of it, I learned at the Angelicum. Two-thirds of it, I did not learn at the Angelicum. I almost got brainwashed into the new church by the Angelicum. So the Angelicum is a lousy institution right now, and it was never a very, very good university in the old days. And the Pope's, uh, uh, the Pope's thesis on uh, S uh, St. John of the Cross is worth nothing. I haven't read it, but I asked very, very good uh, and experienced theologians who read it, and they said it's worth nothing. But it got the highest mark. So, uh, and another thing about this Pope, he never was a Catholic. He did not change. It's not the council that changed the Pope, it's the, it's the Pope who wrote the council. The Pope had the same ideas he has now, long before the council. He wanted the, the, the freedom, I shouldn't say freedom, and this is a country where freedom is sacred, and I agree. The liberty of religions. That's what it should be called. Because freedom means you're free to do your job. Liberty means you're free to do whatever you want. Yeah, license, exactly. So uh, the idea of liber libertas religionum, of the liberty of religions, is, a, is an idea that was very early in his life ingrained in the Pope's mind. Don't forget he was part in a, theor in, in a theater group that uh, was founded by Helena Blavatsky. Ah, yeah. Uh, anthroposophist. That's uh, practically, uh, as the name says, uh, with Greek names, it's very difficult to, to hide the truth because they're so open and clear. Uh, Sophia means wisdom and Anthropos is man. So that should tell you enough. The Psalms say something quite contrary to the effect of wisdom of man. <laughs> okay. Do you know anything about the lady he is pictured in the woods with on his penny? I am not a member of the Catholic National National Enquirer. I'm not. I do not work for Weekly World News. I do not. I, I do not work for Weekly World News, and I prefer Alexander the Sixth. And I prefer Alexander the Sixth, who had children even when he was Pope, over Paul the Sixth a hundred times. <laughs> Alexander the Sixth was a rotten, filthy pig, but he did not pray the church. I have a question and a comment. Go ahead. You made a comment. Well, it's provoking, but you made a comment about about things being translated as written based on the Vatican II or something like that. Right. And that reflects on something or other. I noticed every time we read something from the old Catholic tradition writings or any of the Pope's and Saint Luke's and Pantheon say John the Twenty Third or on to Vatican II and, and the current Pope, in that almost every writing that we read, you, they get to the point within the first paragraph. And any average person like us can understand exactly what they mean. But when we read any of the new Catholic stuff, it's so ambiguous you can't read it without constantly going to the dictionary, constantly trying to make some sense of it, and then having to become your own theologian because you don't understand what they mean. That's the bad side of it. The good yeah. side of it is that the simple people will not bother read it and will right. be less distracted exactly. from the Catholic faith. Exactly. Yeah. If you understand it, then you better. Yeah. <laughs> it's like in, in, um, if you want to read language like this, I recommend the book uh, "Politically Bad, uh, Politically Correct Bedtime Stories," but not this Pope's <laughs> Pope's encyclical. The "Politically Correct Bedtime Stories" is a good book. This Pope's encyclicals are trash. Now the question is very dangerous trash. There was there's been talk about Pope John the Twenty Third when he was elected. Yeah. And they asked if he knew what he would call himself. He, he was already prepared. Uh, National Enquirer know? again. Well, yeah, but the fact that there was already. A How would you know? How would you know? How would you know what his reasons are? Any po any cardinal who speaks uh, about what what happened in the conclave uh, is excommunicated. Do you think that a cardinal who doesn't care about being excommunicated or not mm -hmm. would necessarily tell you the truth? When Cardinal Koenig of Vienna, the old Archbishop of Vienna, was asked on TV if he was a candidate uh, at, the, at the last conclave, he nodded. Broke the vow of uh, conclave once. 
A few minutes later, he was asked if he was one of those who promoted Karl Wojtyla. He nodded again. So within one minute, a prince of the Holy Roman Church, Cardinal uh, Franz Cardinal König, Archbishop of the Archdiocese of Vienna, Austria, was excommunicated twice. Do you think that a, a man like this, highly intelligent, is interested in telling you the truth? No, he will tell you whatever he thinks is useful. And I cannot be accused of slander if I say that because I'm not saying he lied. I'm just saying how would you trust a man who is not interested in the fact if he's excommunicated or not? He broke the vow of silence. He broke the seal of the conclave. So if anybody tells me uh, John the 23rd said the following blah 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 the moment he got elected I will say uh, I, I, as a matter of fact I will go to the next uh, to the next supermarket and get the National Enquirer because at least it's funnier. The Weekly World News is a lot more entertaining than those liars are. Okay, on that note, I think... Well, one last question off the record. Yeah. What is it that you would recommend that we look towards for leadership and guidance in these times where the, the, the church leadership is certainly uh, very different Difficult to trust. And believe. Are the camera is still running. I hope so. Yes. Yeah. Good. Subscribe to the Angelus, and if you find sometimes local problems with the Society of Saint Pius X, forgive them. They are humans. A century ago, not everything was beautiful, beautiful, beautiful in the Catholic Church. But the ones to look for spiritual guidance, the ones you can trust, the Society of Saint Pius X, and the only paper in this country that I would uh, recommend to everybody under all circumstances is the Angelus. Amen to that. To that. Amen.